Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, we're good. Okay, let's just do it. Right. right there. Rock and roll. Okay. Hey. <laughs> we fucking did it. We made it. We're all set up. Good to go. Good to go. I think. Good to go. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to the Calculus of <laughs> IT podcast. It looks like we're like, there's like a, like a, a, a mountain. Dude, dude. It's like a, the price is right. The, uh, Mike sitting at the kids table. <laughs> uh, welcome back to the Calculus of IT podcast, uh, AKA the cognitive load, AKA the home of the sad salad, the one and only sad salad. Love sad uh, salad. AF. I forgot to ask you, by the way, do you know what AF means? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. What uh, does it mean? What does it mean exactly? Always fun. Yeah, always always fun. fun. That's right. Yeah. Always AI fun. is always fun. AI right? always. That's the other way. AI always fun. Always uh, fun. So over to my far right, we have the uh, indomitable. I learned that word. Oh. And musically gifted Michael Crispin. I thought you said abom abominable. Abominable. <laughs> indomitable. <laughs> Michael, and, and musically gifted. Thank you. Thanks musically so musically gifted. Gifted. Listen to this drum solo. Michael, Michael Crispin, a.k.a. Crispo. I am Navy Pride. I have no musical talent. I'm not abominable. And people just call me Nate. And we have a special guest tonight, Nathan Doyle. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank uh, you for having me here. Who, what's your a.k.a.? I'm that guy, but not that guy. So he's the guy <laughs> behind the guy next to the guy. <laughs> right. Uh, so awesome. Welcome. Glad you could make it. We have uh, an epic show tonight. I did a very short pre-read. Super on, short. On Monday night for the chapter that we're covering tonight. So through the miracles of sort of modern technology, technological things, we're just going to all of a sudden be talking about the chapter in just a few minutes. But it's going to be like I sat here and read the chapter all by myself. Unbelievable. So, I know. It's magic. What an advancement. I know. <laughs> Unbelievable. You can do like these things now with uh, the iMovie and uh, Ma Microsoft Paint. Windows Movie Maker. Windows Movie Maker. GIF Maker. Still um, run a Vista? <laughs> That's just running right there. It's a Windows Vista, yeah. Right and then there. Windows 7 here and uh, MS DOS here. Uh, so, uh, before we begin, I do want to make well, it's not really an announcement, I guess. It's more of like we already did this. Yeah. We do have a, a website, but up until now, the website has pointed to the longwalk.consulting media page which is where our podcast was sort of centralized. And now we have the coit.us website. Uh, we're working on some DNS stuff right now to make some, some web trickery. Yep. So if it doesn't work for you at the time this episode launches, just keep trying because we're just trying to like bypass spending money. Uh, but we may also ultimately have to get We have in failed at that. <laughs> and spend money to make DNS work. So go figure, DNS is not as democratic as and free as we thought. Um, we also have a new Instagram account. We're on the yeah. Insta. We're on the line. Oh, Insta. Yeah, Insta. We made it to the line, Mike. I'm loving it. I'm loving all this social media presence. I know. And uh, I was trying to get on um, the Facebook, but apparently it's called now Facebook. Yeah. And sound of one in word. In MySpace, no. my account wasn't working anymore, so we went to the Insta. And, and I, I'm not actually sad to admit this. I'm very happy to admit that my daughter, Kate, who is a social media savant, I think would be the word I would use, is actually going to be running our socials. Our socials, because we have a TikTok too. The TikTok <laughs> is the calculus of IT. Yep. And the Instagram is... The calculus the of calculus IT. The calculus of IT. I was, I was hoping that you would get that. I, I am glad we've landed on a title. That's good. We're, yes. Episode... <laughs> What episode is this again? 13? Episode, this is episode 13, but chapter 15. Because see, I, I combined, you know, I did I did combine some episodes and stuff. Yeah. We'll catch up. Don't worry. Because we'll have a chapter that takes like four episodes. So it'll all work out in the end. So uh, this is great. 
And Nathan's just overwhelmed right now. He's like, I don't even know what the hell I'm doing here. My reputation's <laughs> swirling down the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so many things and new ways to bring extraordinarily intelligent, though slightly inebriated technology discussions to the masses, to the smart masses. Um, mm. So, when are we launching our calculus coin? On Web 3.0? Uh, that'll be in four years' time. Okay, so four <laughs> years from now, that's 2020 today plus four years. Uh, we're going to launch Calculus Coin on the Web 3.0, Web 4.0. I was looking on line. Instagram today, and Gartner has an Instagram. Gartner has an Instagram? They do, and one of the things they put up on their Instagram publicly is that Web 3 is six to seven years away. So we could technically beat that. Yeah, we could get there hey, here before that. Cheers. Cheers to, you know what, anytime we can be ahead of, wait, actually, we're always ahead of Gardner. What am I talking about? Upper right quadrant, get so, there. Uh, yeah, upper right quadrant, <laughs> trough of disillusionment. I'm drinking the trough of disillusionment right now. Hey, what are we drinking tonight? What do you have? The hype cycle. This is uh, Conmara. Conmara. Did or, I say that right? Conimara. 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 Oh, jeez. And Con I'm also having Conimara. Conimara. And you are having? I don't want to mispronounce this. What is the? Uh, it's Glendalo. Gl Glendalo. Yeah. Glendalo. Double, double barrel. Yeah. Very. The tasty. single barrel, unfortunately, it was just not double enough, so we went with <laughs> double barrel. So cheers, gents. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Let's have some more. Mm. You know, I've been coming to this oh, that's pool good. party for ten years, and it never gets old. <laughs> if you want to continue, <laughs> so if you want to continue the conversations about all this deep stuff we're talking about, if you want to learn about Web 3.0 or 4.0, we should actually beat Gartner on Web 4.0 too. Let's just do, let's go Web 5.0 and skip all that shit. You know how Verizon skipped 6, 7, 8, and 9G and went to 10G? Yeah. Why can't we skip a bunch of numbers? Just need Neuralink and we can start moving the mouse around with our brains. Did you read that today? <clears throat> No, but we'll get to that. Oh. Mike, you're spoiling oh. the show. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, stay tuned because next year we'll have Web 6.0 launched right here live on this show. And we can't disclose it yet. Still, we're working with the NSA on some things, but we're going to get that out there. I also want to mention that if you like our show, please give us the maximum amount of stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube. I don't think YouTube does stars, but the maximum thumbs ups. Or whatever you listen to, just give us the maximum amount of things. We would we would give them to you. If I yep. could give you, the listener, the maximum of anything beyond the cognitive load I'm about to give you, then I would give you that maximum amount of things. Mm. So in return, could you please give us the maximum amount of things? It would be cool. Also, we have new merchandise in our spread shirt store. Ooh, I gotta nice. check this out. Very nice. We have our new sad salad shirts. Uh, I'll have one on next week. Uh, next week's episode. They're awesome. We did have cognitive load shirts up. They were immediately pulled down because the logo looked identical to some random, I and mean, you might have heard of it, soft drink brand called Coca Cola, Cola, yeah. something like that. They so took, that, they took we, that one down. We violated a copyright. So this show is actually now going to be called the Cancelled Show. <laughs> All the shit we get canceled from, we're just going to go ahead and call it the Cancelled Show and tell you about what we get canceled from this week. <gasps> those came out awesome, man. Like how awesome those came out. Wow. The Sad Salad Shirts. So that's the C-O-I-T, T-H-E-C-O-I-T dot myspreadshop.com. Is that right? Or go to www dot the, the, the C -O -I -T C -O -I -T dot dot U.S. US. And there's a merchant link. And there's a merchant link there. Plus, in all of our episodes, on all the things, you'll see links in the description that has a link to the merch store. So, yeah. um, you know, in order for us to afford guests like Nathan here and to afford to be able to buy him Glendalo for the show and feed him and nurture him and take care of him and mold his young mind, right. we need uh, some money. <laughs> So if airline you fees, up. hotel fees, yep. right, all that, yeah. And honestly, yeah. if we get like a certain number of stars, apparently we can open up ways to um, get better things on the socials. Open it up, baby. Let's open it up. So, 
before we go on, I want to comment quickly on last week. Um, so if you watched last week's episode or listened to it yet, you probably heard a lot of um, like cuts. I think there were ended up being 10 or 11 or 12 cuts where I tried try to say the word strategic. You did it. I, I know. Just that I did. But most of the time I can't say it. And I've been practicing all weekend. And so tonight I'm going to try a few times. But it just even on Monday night's recording, I had to cut it out. So I apologize if you're like, what the hell did you just say? What was that word? St strategic or st strap -jick or whatever he's just said? <laughs> because I, I didn't I missed those and I didn't cut them out. So that's the word I was trying to say. Strategic. 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 Maybe that's how I should start saying it. Anyway, I don't know what was going on. I wasn't even that drunk. It just couldn't come off my tongue and I lied words a lot. So anyway. So in a bit, we're going to get to this week's chapter, which is chapter 15 uh, of the Life Sciences IT Survival Guide, which is on governance, which, if you ask me, is just absolutely dead sexy. I mean, nobody asked me, but I'm just going to say that anyway. Yeah. Um, in fact, the only person who probably thinks it's dead sexy is me, but that's okay. And next week, though, I want to plug next week's, next week's episode because we'll be talking about the employee experience or the employee life cycle and the employee experience. And this is... a just a monumental episode. I think we're going to be really diving into everything from two weeks before you're hired to two weeks after you're fired, everything that happens to you in between everything that it has to do along that journey, everything that you as an employee uh, go through along that journey. And so as you can see, it's no small feat. Um, the chapter itself just really captures the, that we're going to discuss the element of what it is responsible for, but we're going to try and take on sort of the bigger um, enchilada, uh, for the episode, so it's going to be really good, and it's almost as sexy as governance, like right there. It's right um, up there. Solid number two. Yeah, and it's one of those key pillars that we will come back to for the rest of the episodes is that employee experience piece. Sure. Um, it's also an important part of compliance, which is part of governance, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so be sure to turn tune in next week for that episode. Uh, also, if you're in the Cambridge area. Cambridge, Massachusetts area on February 27th, and you want to see me go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a quality veteran, an OG, uh, if you will, check out my LinkedIn post on my LinkedIn page, which is linkedin.com slash ITSN8. I don't know what the rest is, but just go to that page and <laughs> or look at me on LinkedIn, and you'll see the post for the Swear event. It's hosted by Swear. When they have the rescue platform, I gotta plug Swear real quick. Um, Swear makes this platform called Rescue. It's freaking awesome. Um, it takes all the bullshit out of um, keeping your SaaS platforms validated. So we love them. And they've invited me to be a panelist on this dinner. It's a two hour dinner, tons of drinks. Again, you get to listen to me make an ass out of myself by trying to say why next generation uh, validation is for the birds and then have to defend my position. And like I said before, <laughs> it's um, free booze and food. It's an awesome that place. Um, so uh, as a reminder, also, when BioIT World comes to Boston, April 16th and 17th, Mike and I, and hopefully Nathan and others, will be, well, we'll be crashing BioIT World. And I've already asked for a press pass. I feel like I'm going to get rejected or, or canceled on that idea. So oh. if we can't get into BioIT World and set up shop for a podcast, we're going to go next door to either, um, what is it? Uh, Rosa Mexicana? No, Smith & Walensky is to the left oh, of oh, oh. the center, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, What's yeah. What's on the corner there? Ruth Chris or Smith and & Oh, um, what, what are you talking about, the seaport? No, no, no. This, oh. is, this is not at BCEC. This oh, is oh. at the uh, World Trade Center there. Oh. So if you walk out of the World Trade Center and go immediately left, right at the corner, I think it's Smith and Walensky. Oh, M Morton's. Morton's, thank you. Morton's. One of those, and we'll, we'll tell you about it, but you can come and be on the podcast. You can actually come and be on the live podcast. We'll ply you with alcohol if you're over 21, uh, get you food, and then we'll have a good time. Yeah. So we'll also over. have a ton of special guests. Either way, mark your calendars for BioIT World in Boston, April 16th to 17th. Um, so, okay, I just talked for a little bit. Anything you guys want to note about anything i'm excited for bio it world that will be fantastic to yeah. get everyone together and just to to talk so totally time. openly yeah yeah and hopefully they won't uh they won't throw us out of morton's if that's where we end up we don't have a lemonade stand or something out front with, with some 
Should I bring a folding table just in case? I think we're, we're going to pretty much have to pack up all this shit here. Yeah. And just nonchalantly walk up to a table somewhere and set it up and steal their power and their Wi-Fi and try to do this podcast. I'm working on that, too. We, we'll we'll right. get a solution for that, possibly. He's got some things going on. <laughs> uh, we're ready to go. Before we go any further, uh, Nathan. Yes, sir. We said your name. Yes. But we didn't say anything else about you. Yeah, it's, it's like it's like mystery guests with just a name. I know. So he's not very like sitting mystery. here. He's like, he's like, why the hell are they? They're just talking around me. Uh, Nathan's an expert. Quite in, generally, in so many things about IT, I don't even know how to list them all. But I'll let you just kind of give you a quick uh, overview of who you are, where you're coming from. Yeah. Don't tell us why you're here because we don't want anyone else to know that no. we, we bribed you to be here. Yeah, no, no, no. Let's, we'll keep the hush money a lot. I mean, yeah, right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, yeah, appreciate the uh, the invite, guys. Thank you for having me on the podcast today. Um, see, uh, you know, as, as I stated earlier, Nathan Doyle, um, I've been uh, working in industry for life sciences the last 10 to 12 years. Uh, overall, though, I've been managing IT and managing uh, services for businesses for the last 23 years. Yeah. Um, I got out of the military in 2003. Uh, I served as a gunner's mate in the United States Navy. Uh, not applicable Thank you to very anything much, I did. By the way. Oh, yes. yeah. Yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, I found myself in a, in a very uh, interesting uh, uh, position. And it was, you know, what did I want to do? And I, I thought, you know, there are three things I'm very good at talking which anybody watching the podcast that knows me is You're the perfect place. Genuinely yes. laughing out loud right now saying, yep, that's that guy, right? Uh, <laughs> helping bring people together, right? And I love problems. And that's sort of a, you know, people use the term opportunity as a sort of, you know, comp- you know rip and replace for that. But that's yep. since I was very, very young, I've always looked at problems as being intriguing. Awesome. Um, and so I felt I could take being conversational, being somebody that brings people together and somebody that can help, you know, look at problems and... You, not necessarily unique ways, but is willing to take it on. And how do I, you know, help people? You know, I started off by building MSPs, uh, supporting companies in the West Coast, California specifically, Mm -hmm. um, and then found myself in a really unique opportunity when I moved out here to Massachusetts, uh, working with a venture capital firm uh, who specifically focuses in biotech, and they offered me an opportunity to go work inside, you know, internal IT. It was the first internal role I'd really sort of taken on in about, 20 years and awesome. you know 15 years and i said yeah i'll do that and been been off to the races ever since you know really focusing on life science and r&d awesome fantastic we have, we have the the most perfect topic for you tonight which is why we asked you to come on board because <laughs> um who better to sort of help us sort of dissect this idea of putting in rules mm. than somebody who's been on the side of it and in life sciences where all the rules are very critical yes um well thanks for coming out yeah appreciate it again appreciate yeah. it it is cold in the barn, by the way, but, you know, you're the mayonnaise in the Mike and Nate sandwich, and so... It's the sweater. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the sweater. I like that. That's the type of mayo I can get behind. Yes. That's the type I can he get actually, behind. Actually, it's mayonnaise. It's mayonnaise it between two pieces of dark rye. I love it. We want everybody at home to think, we did plan this. No, we didn't. But no, we didn't. <laughs> I'm thinking of a certain type of cookie. But I did plan on putting Mike at the kids' table. Yeah, I got the, I got here. I like how this like this progression, you know. So I I just prefer standing now. Like I stood we stood, but last week and it just feels I don't know. I feel like more. You like can a, you can talk more with your hands yeah, and more. Yeah. yeah. So we don't have a sponsor. Oh, do you have a sponsor tonight? I don't have a sponsor tonight. We didn't, nobody called us for a sponsor, but I'm just going to replug soup because last week that was awesome. I mean, we love soup. This is basically by our definition. This is soup, by the way. It's a liquid in a bowl, hence soup. I got a call from Rye Toast. <laughs> I uh, I did. So so my, my, my plug just then was not intentional. What's that? Or it was intentional. My plug for a dark rye. It, it no no this is uh this is light rye. Oh light rye. Yes. Um, sorry. Dark uh, Arnold's rye. Arnold's uh, in particular <laughs> Arnold's rye or Billy's rye. Billy's rye. Billy's rye is very good. Um, I, I like how crispy rye toast gets. You get, it's very hard to burn rye toast, no matter how much you cook it. Because you can't it, tell. It says you can't tell, and it's always you can burn the crap out of it, and it just and it, it doesn't break. You know, you burn toast and it turns into powder, like rye toast that doesn't happen. You can really, it stays together. I just want to. That's that's what I'm talking about. That's real solidarity and continuity in a piece of bread. I think it's fantastic. Uh, that is 
That's very that, meta of you. Right toast is a symbol so right of toast. how strong okay. we are. All right, well, you know what, right, fantastic. and by the way, if you have a bowl of soup, and you have some <laughs> rye toast on the side. You can dip it in, it will not get soggy, unless right you really, there. you really go crazy yeah. with that. Wow, rye toast. Bread we should have some next time, we'll get some out. Well, why don't you ask your sponsors at Rye Toast to send us some rye toast, and then we can have a plate of it out front, and like a display of toast. That'd be fantastic. I right. would be crunching on that the whole, all the microphone and everything be all crunchy so and gross. So next year, gross. while we're talking about employee experience and life cycle, we'll be doing an ASMR session of toast eating live for you with burnt bio IT world white stacked rye up to the ceiling. Toast, yes. <laughs> right toast. So, um, well, thank you for that. I'm glad that we're the money keeps rolling in from the sponsors as well as the free hard bread and. Well, I just got a call, so I'm working on them still. But okay. I figured I'd give them a shout out. Maybe that would push us over the line, so they really will be a sponsor. That's awesome. I want to. I did want to plug Focal IO again. Uh, we talked mentioned about them, mentioned about them, in I think episode two or three. But that's who we switched from, uh, from Atlassian's help to Focal.io for our um, internal help desk workflow in Slack, and it's awesome. Um, I can only get a few tickets a month anyway, but when I do get them, they're automatically routed right from Slack. Um, so big, big shouts to Focal. They, they're, they're, they're basically filling a big gap too, where help is being deprecated into the sort of like the Atlassian wastelands. Uh, Focal is sort of rising to the cream of the crop in terms of um, what I think is the best of Slack based help desk platforms. It's basically web based too. I mean, there's a portal and everything a la Zendesk, but it's real meat and potatoes, I think, is in its Slack integration. So thank yeah. you, Focal. Um, and lastly, I don't know if I said this last week or the week before, but did I mention how shitty one specific vendor is that um, canceled us? Have I, have I talked about that Yeah, vendor? the last two weeks we've brought them up. Okay, so I'm not going to bring them up again. They're getting uh, free advertising. But I did want to, I, did, I, I was thinking the other day, and I wanted to point something out. Did you know that if you add the word or the letters IFY, to the end of any noun, you like immediately get a e-tail store. Try wow. it. Try it now. Like say a noun, any noun. Right toastify. Right toastify. What does that site sell? Right toast. Exactly. Try it. Nathan, go ahead and try one. Mm. Oh, that was not the right word to pick in my head. Um. <laughs> says, I, 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 I just delete everything that we don't like. I, I, I was going to go with say. Twinkieify, but my brain went many different directions and said, don't do that. What, is it, what does that site sell? Oh, yeah. That's the, the dilemma that I wanted to walk away lard, from. Lard bombs. Oh, lard oh, bombs. Lard bombs. Magical right. lard bombs. Yeah, magical, magical lard bombs. Yes. Oh. Deep fryable magical so lard good. bombs. So if you, if you take any noun and you put the word I or the letters IFY after it, and then you do dot .com, you can create a website that is, it requires no talent, like this other website that we know, requires no developer skill, requires no good customer service, requires back-ass sort of uh, customer management, and you too can have a, a FI website, just like somebody else that we know. Yeah. So just take a noun, or, or even a verb, or an adjective, any word, anything really, just any sound. Mm. Put a fi at the end of it. Do you want to know something that's awesome? Unlike the if fies. What? As Nathan mentioned, Twinkies. You have gotta try freezing one. Have you tried that before? Freezing Ooh. a Twinkie. Take a Twinkie and put it in the freezer. Well, hold on, is Twinkie our sponsor? No, no. But I'm get, maybe they'll give me. A, I'm trying to help us here by getting some I'm just better checking. sponsors. Like, I don't know. You tell me. I don't know. So, who the so put anymore. a Twinkie in the freezer if you got them, and and then you eat them the next day. It's magical. Frozen so, Twinkies. I know what we're going to do for next episode. Frozen Twinkies? Next week, we're going to start the show off by doing three things. We're going to, first of all, eat burnt white rye toast. Got to, it. Got to love celebrate it. our sponsor. Two, mm. we're going to swallow down a frozen Twinkie. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus okay, and not the same one. We'll, have, we'll all have our own We'll have our Twinkie, own, each of us. Frozen Twinkies that we'll... we'll you know, tr we'll just we'll we'll start a time, we'll start a timer so you can eat the frozen turkey the fastest. It's still chewy. It doesn't, you know. That's the lard. Yeah, yeah. It's still and then edible. The third thing we'll do is we're going to throw good. up in a bucket back here after we're done <laughs> together. So, wait, we have a bucket sponsor? 
We don't have a bucket <laughs> where you can sponsor. Buckets are great. They're so useful. Uh, so next week, right? Just the first, tune into the show because right in the beginning, we're going to do a double food boot challenge uh, with you. <laughs> we actually won't throw up. Mike will probably throw up, but I won't. Not at all. I have, I'm, I'm holding it I down. I have an iron stomach. Uh, okay. So. And on the governance from there. I mean, how do you. You're bridging it. It's fantastic. See, watch my segue. Ready? Okay. <laughs> so tonight, we're talking about governance. I did there. They didn't even know that, that happened. That was beautiful. I'm the magic, I'm the magic <laughs> So <guy>. smooth. <laughs> Shake and bake. Shake and bake. <laughs> okay. So, seriously now, serious faces. Back into character. Um, and my heater kicks on right at this moment. <laughs> By the way, you have to get used to that noise. That's my 7,000 BTU blower blowing heat that direction in the barn. And it circles all the way back around and finally hits us later. Uh, so we continue to come back to the idea of training and development in this podcast. Mm -hmm. And this is something that will probably be uh, a cornerstone of every single episode, some more than others, uh, in terms of how much time we spend on it. But in terms of its importance, training and development is a key element of everything that happens in IT. Yeah. Um, whether we're discussing the need to train yourself, or the IT department, or your, you know, your staff, hmm. or the organization at large, it's a recurring theme, okay? So tonight we're talking about governance, and that's chapter 15 of the Life Sciences IT Survival Guide, as I already mentioned. This is one of those chapters that is both industry agnostic and also critical, I think, for survival of IT process. So, I mean, basically you can survive at being, and we've talked about budgeting, you can survive in a company by being a shitty budgeting man. I mean, you'll get by. You won't be like everyone's best friend, but you cannot survive uh, at all by being a shitty governance architect. Like, you just won't make it, okay? Because because when the process starts to break down, everyone's just going to wonder, like, what the hell you do all day? Well, what would you say you do all day? <laughs> so we'll come back to the theme of governance and decentralized IT, which is a key part of it after the chapter read, and explore it in more detail. But for the moment, before we get into the chapter, I really want to take a stab at essentially what are the basic three key elements needed to support what we're going to talk about later, which is a decentralized IT department. And, and how does this matter in terms of governance? Well, for governance, you need to actually have an organizational definition. Like you need to say, my IT department is going to be matrixed, it'll be centralized, decentralized, federated, hierarchical, whatever you're going to do for your organization, you have to define it because as that definition will will sort of, as a definition will define the way your group talks to each other, so it will also define the way you talk to the organization. So for instance, if I have a matrix IT department, you know, head of IT, four direct leads, they have direct leads, so on and so forth, and sitting in one place, single location, one set of processes, well then, we all kind of know up and down the stack what we have to do with each other, and it's pretty clear across with whom we interact what the processes are. If you go into a decentralized structure, you get a sort of more autonomous way of doing this. You're having sort of a person who's responsible for IT. Then you'll have other groups that are all, of course, themselves responsible for IT, whether they're responsible for IT for a certain team, yeah. geographical location, a certain business unit, a certain project. Decentralizing IT allows you to have a single leader who mostly manages the general strategy of the company, then everything else is sort of sent, sent across to different groups. This is where governance is such a key element. So 
which is why I'm going to talk about it today from a decentralized IT perspective, and we're going to sort of dissect that. So if you want to build a decentralized IT model, and it's kind of controversial for a lot of people, um, it does represent a loss of power. Okay, so CIOs that are sort of power hungry, they like to build walls around their sort of departments, uh, look at decentralized IT as sort of the, the anti way to do IT. Mm -hmm. But for those CIOs who have the capability and the time and are willing to sort of extend their reach into the business a little bit further, um, it might be one of the best scenarios you can do. So <clears throat> in the second book that I wrote, Calculus of IT, I did describe decentralized IT in a sort of high level manner and I'm just going to read that now. Uh, you don't have to read that book. We'll get to that in season two. But effectively, in a decentralized IT, like I said, each business unit or office location or team uh, has its own IT group, its own budget, its own set of processes, etc. And there's no centralized IT department as you would see it today. Okay, there is an IT leader, probably an executive. They report directly into the executive team. Then there's all these other groups okay, that exist. The IT leader provides some high-level strategy and direction, but does not control each of the separate IT teams. So you could have like a global CIO, then you could have a CIO of North America, a CIO of Europe, a CIO of South America, whatever. Is it called Europe anymore? Um, it's broken yeah. down into sort of small teams, um, Asian pack, etc. So the IT staff res reports to the heads of their respective business units, not to any central IT organization. Hmm. IT decisions like technology purchases, purchases, systems, policies, processes are made locally by each business unit. There are no overarching company-wide standards for those so, smaller operational tasks. So just to jump in for, for one minute, like yeah. I think in, we're talking more in a smaller, small, medium-sized organization right here because a lot of companies do have different IT departments. Yes. Right in different different geographies, other right. that, that all report into maybe one CIO or even into a executive team member. It's the reporting into that ultimately matters. So yeah. if you go from the bottom most person, and you can follow a logical yeah. chain where you're connecting the dots to the CIO, yep. you're still centralized IT. Sure. If you can, if you find a break in that chain where all of a sudden that person stops reporting up the IT chain and their their units closed off, then you technically have a decentralized model. Yep. Okay. Now, there's still a head of IT. The head of IT is mostly saying, okay, in five years, we're switching, switching over to Google Workspace. Now, everybody else go do that. Right? That's They're coming up with a big, giant idea strategy. So you just said, but you just said that there are no global standards, right? I think that's one thing where that you, you're, even if you're in a distributed or decentralized IT, maybe I misheard you, um, that, that the IT department will act as sort of the enablement government governance governance function that will help the other distributed IT firms sort of make sure there's some semblance of organization and rules whether it be cybersecurity or other right uh, well it's not exactly what I said so okay. what I said was the IT leader provides high level strategy and direction yep but does not control the individual IT team so for instance if I was the global CIO of a company yeah yep. I was saying okay we're all going to Google Workspace in five years, then it's yeah. up to you as the North American CIO to carry this out. Now, how you do that is entirely independent of your team. Yeah. You can do it in one year, you can do it in five. You can do it way before everybody else, or it can cost you three times as much, but you're yeah. responsible now for doing that and, and communicating this to your team. Got it. But you said there are no, there are no overarching standards, right? That's, that, is that... Well, you could also say, like, it depends on the CIO. You could say, we're going to have everybody use two-factor authentication globally. Yep. Now, yep. you could then say, well, I'm gonna use Okta, and you could say, well, I'm gonna use Azure, or I'm gonna use whatever. Mm, yeah. And so, in that case, yes, you're setting more of a, more of a conceptual standard. Gotcha. Everyone else is coming up with the technology standards. I mean, it's semantics, but yeah, yeah. ultimately, the CIO is setting a technology vision, okay? Let's take it yeah. to the highest level possible. Yeah, yeah. Everyone else is responsible for executing that, but to the, to the standards necessary for their particular thing. Got it, okay. got it. Now, in the case of decentralized IT, business units purchase their own PCs, server, software, mic, network network equipment as per their local needs, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. I mean, you can, have, you can have a 
huge division in China and they can't use Google. So what yeah. you're going to do, you can't actually have a Google mandate for the company. You have to use something else, right? Like the point is that the, the CIO is probably setting a very vague, but broad standard yep. of some level, but everyone else is responsible for carrying that out. Ultimately. Sure. Okay. okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Notably, there's no central IT procurement that's usually handled by the individual functional units. <clears throat> Many different technologies and vendors are used across the company as local IT teams select their own preferred solutions. As such, each business unit makes independent choices regarding cloud versus on-premise, given that there's no central strategy. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you get to the point where the CIO is saying, everyone will go cloud, but I don't care how you do it. Like, whatever the, or, or as, mo as most cloud as you can, that would be a case where, you know, again, there's a there's a broad edict. Everyone's left to make their own strategic decision. Got it. Right. Um, and the strengths of this, of course, is the model aligns to the corporate functions that these individual units support. IT has more specialized expertise, which allows for, of course, increased responsiveness to their responsiveness to their respective functions. So yep. if I have an IT team that's supporting a finance group for North America, we only care about finance. Nothing else matters. Right. Mm -hmm. IT allows, it allows for more autonomy and agility that individual business aligned leads. Decision making is localized between the function and the IT liaison. Solutions can be tailored by function and tighter alignment and stakeholder relationships can be built. But on the weaknesses side, there's an abundance for a duplication of effort, resources, or systems. Mm -hmm. It can be difficult to coordinate IT programs at the enterprise level. There's a likelihood for inconsistent architecture and technology Standards can fluctuate, and there can be difficulty implementing and enforcing IT policy, and lack of standardizations can lead to fragmented systems, both process and platform-wise. Now, in that cons column or problems column, every single one of those is something that can be solved by governance. Governance, right. Now, yep. also from the same book, I took another passage out, and again, I'm reading a lot. We'll get to the discussion in just a second, but let me just get through this. Um, again, I want to point out that I, I'm a huge believer and that an IT leader should carry not only experience and leadership, but should have a wealth and depth of ex experience across all facets of IT. This includes having a strong background in security, as noted above, but the IT leader should also have an equally strong background in project management. Now, <clears throat> one thing I want to be clear about is we'll talk, we'll talk about project management from a couple different angles tonight, because after you go through this chapter read in a few minutes, you'll hear me use things like project management, project guidance, process management, process guidance, at the end of the day, they all mean the same thing, which is you have a structured set of steps which help you accomplish a thing that you said you would do here and it should look like this here and along the way you got it done, okay? I mean, like that's the most simplified version. I'm oversimplifying it to an extreme degree, but when I say project management here, that's what I'm referring to. <laughs> for a new co's sake, for a new company's sake, it would generally already have a centralized PMO, a decentralized PMO, basic project governance and no PMO or nothing at all resembling governance. Any one of these is possible. Okay. So it could be the most uh, experienced kind of project management office, which is a centralized one. Next level down, you have a decentralized one, but still one that functions. Then you have basic project governance, which is, we know how to install something. And then there's uh, no organization at all. And then lastly, there's just everyone doing everything for themselves. <laughs> Regardless, this does not mean the IT leader, you, has no responsibility here, especially considering the majority of IT projects affect a large part, if not all, of the organization. The bottom line is that IT will have projects that have business visibility, consume resources, use budgets, affect customers, and have a lifetime of impact, regardless of the length of their subject's existence. Therefore, it makes perfect sense that some type of project and task management model should be used within IT, okay? regardless of the model of IT, including decentralized IT. The question here is, should there be an actual dedicated segment of IT for project management? Okay, that's a big question. And we'll come back to that in just a few moments, but think about this. Like I've worked in companies where project management reported into IT because IT does the most amount of work with regards to different projects. Other groups will do projects. Clinical will file, you know, uh, an IND with regulatory or research will go ahead and you know, just run an experiment. Like these are all very process-based, step-based things, but are they programmatically going to affect the entire enterprise? I mean, are they are they so in depth where there's multiple functional lines coming together to achieve a thing? Perhaps, 
but IT generally gets the, the burden of having a project management office inside of it. Now, somebody else in the business can also have a project management office too. And so the question becomes, should IT have anything to do with corporate project management? So we'll hold that one for a moment. So let's look at some of the positives and negatives of this possibility, and then we'll discuss. So having a dedicated governance team in IT means that it gives you, the IT leader, and for the rest of the IT department, insight into project priorities, resources, and timelines for planning purposes. You get the goods before anybody else. You essentially get the ability, the high line into data, so you can have the best strategic plan. See, I said strategic, strategic there. Beautiful. Almost got it right. Especially important for high visibility, high, visibility, high cost projects. The project team's presence within IT enables the team to align project delivery capacity with demand. Further, it can also help with the prioritization of objectives. IT project managers can leverage IT, uh, including infrastructure, tools, and processes for managing their projects. So they also get the inside line on the best tools and procedures, but way before anybody else. While they could do this from an outsider's perspective, there's an opportunity for a linkage directly to IT resources like help desk platforms and similar resources in terms of utilization platforms. While this may only seem relevant to project managers, having them inside of IT also allows for potential career lateral development into other branches of technology. So you can have a project management person go into business analytics, which then transforms into development and then something else. Okay. Rooting a project management function in IT also creates clear escalation pathways between project teams. That goes without saying. Now, potential negatives. Inherently, there's always the risk that projects may become too IT-centric versus business-centric. It may also be perceived in the business that IT has an advantage over other projects that require technology. And of course we do. But for which the business leaders sit outside of IT. It is more likely than not that many of the IT staff, including managers, lack experience or skills in project management. There will definitely need to be a quote unquote period of patience in terms of bringing everyone in IT up to speed on what project management is, as defined by you, the IT leader, how it works and how it impacts the group and the company at large. If your project managers are resourced within IT, there's always the risk, especially in a centralized model, that they will have less visibility into what is happening with the rest of the business operations. This is one of those cases where decentralized project management comes in handy, because if you have a Functional, if you have decentralized functional IT units across the entire division, each one having their own project manager, then you can have those project managers create a decentralized PMO. That's right, Mike. Mm. Now, depending on how much governance you instill in your IT department, you may end up with creating too much bureaucracy, which can and does impede the agility and empowerment of project teams, especially those already operating at a slower pace than the rest of IT. And I've seen this happen in real time where we went too far in implementing process. Mm -hmm. Too far, such that functional lines didn't meet their deadlines to launch an ERP or to launch a solution because IT was too mired in saying, no, we're sticking to these steps one at a time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Infighting can happen. Disputes between IT and project managers lack a neutral resolution. If my IT project manager reports to me, I disagree, we don't have a third party to go to. There's sort of no neutral place to go and resolve that. Um, so you have to make sure that your IT project manager is in obviously total alignment with the IT strategic plan. I said it again. All right, <clears throat> I'm tired of talking. Now it's your turn. Mike, Nathan. Okay, everything I just said, uh, ignore all of it and yep. tell me about decentralized IT, the pros and cons, or talk about some of that. But what I wanna know is, and what everyone wants to know is, we're about to spend a ton of time talking about governance. How does decentralized IT fit into this? I think, uh, so decentralized, the description you gave, I think is slightly more out there than I would say. I think of more of a distributed, IT, based on what you had written there, that there being like no lack of standards um, in, in terms of- well, bring without it back, Bring it back in for us. Without, without governance, right? So it's important that, you know, in a, in a distributed, oh, there you go, yeah. It'll load, load up, baby. Yeah. Um, that you bring bring that back in as an IT function, like even in a distributed or um, decentralized model. That 
IT is ultimately uh, responsible for holding down the standards and for helping to build a project management methodology and to have a pro decision making process for all of those functions that are going to have technology leaders in them. Uh, in IT people, perhaps, um, there really, there's no IT people anymore. It's more business people who are who know how to use technology. And there's so many business technologists. There's so many more of them now that I think uh, more and more in sort of CVs and resumes, there's a lot of technology built into even a, you know, in, someone who might be in the finance group or someone who may be in the clinical group. Um, so it's, I, I see the decentralized model can really work as long as there's a hub model in IT to handle cybersecurity governance, which we're going to talk about tonight, which is crucial for a distributor decentralized model to work. So there are some rules. It's like having a country with no government, right? So you've got to have something in the middle that's helping to make sure the rules and the laws are abided by. I don't like the word governance because when I look at, we can talk more about governance, but just in terms of governance as a, as a cell, if governance is done well and business process management is done well, the, the company will operate smoothly. It enables the business. And I think people hear governance and they go, oh, God, more paperwork, more processes. I don't even understand why you need to do half of this crap. And it's, it's got to be more about how we repeat the same processes that work over and over again so they become part of the culture of the company. Um, and in a decentralized model, that can all work if you have governance. But there's, I think that governance, cybersecurity, perhaps even standards and enterprise architecture need to be centralized. And the rest can all be distributed. So, so the is, governance piece and the architecture piece kind of go together in my mind. So, so in your t what you're talking about is what I define in the Calculus of IT book as matrix IT, where you have a combination of both decentralized and centralized IT working at the same time. So there's yeah. an IT leader, there's a central philosophy, and that's distilled down to the respective groups. Uh, yep. And they themselves have to execute that specific philosophy. Yeah, you, you need. I think you do need some some level of. You have to have some it's rules not, and some standards, um, strictly right. from a cybersecurity perspective. Sure, sure. It's yeah. not as open as saying, "Okay, we're all going to do this in the next five years. You go figure it out." To more like, yeah. "Okay, we're all going to do this in, in the next five years, and this is how you're going to do it." And then the qu I guess the question back on the decentralized, truly decentralized model is: What is the role of the CIO? Is it just to be a visionary? I mean. That's it. Well, that I mean, we can bring consultants in to be visionaries. Oh, so I mean, I right? can, I can. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going. I'm just saying. I don't that want to say a name or a title from, but from a business person's, perspective. This is not in this barn, but there's an individual who is uh, representing about thirty-eight billion dollars right now in corporate investments, who is a um, a, a a chief digital and technology officer, has no direct reports. Wow, and Where this, can person we get this, speaks, this person speaks a lot. <laughs> they speak a lot. So they talk about um, you know IT visions and what their company's doing and what they're planning. Yep. They actually have no operational impact on their CIOs that, yeah. that uh, also do IT. So then that model, that person's saying, yeah, as a company, we're going to you know X Y Z. They're CTO. They're they're they're, on the, they're publicly visible too, right? They're gonna. In this particular company, they're not public, actually. No, no. I mean, in terms of the, this person's role is oh, yeah, to yeah. be exposed sure, sure. and visible and and be very. Yeah, and this. Yeah. And so I know I know two of this person's CIOs directly, and that is a decentralized model. They they are given like these wackadoodle visions. Yep. To understand. Sounds awesome. But, but, <laughs> Sounds fun. <laughs> but in, in truth, in truth, a, a real decentralized IT Sounds organization, fun. when run run right, means that I have. Like I've gone ahead and assessed everything as, as a head of IT. Yeah. I have a vision and now, so I go to my CIOs or my leads from my functional units and I say, okay, Mike, you're overseeing Asia PAC. We have to get to here. Yep. Like, do you understand my vision? Yep. You're going to say, you know, yes or no or whatever. I'm like, okay, cool. Now go do that vision. And then I'm responsible. Like I get the credit. Yep. I'm responsible for like, yes, Asia PAC con con uh, did this thing. Whereas Nathan's saying, like, okay, North America, like, I can do that, no problem. What mm -hmm. if I also did this? And I'm saying, oh, that's fine. You do whatever you want. Yep. But you're going to execute this bigger vision up here. Got it. So they're setting that leadership part, like, oh, do you need help? Just come and talk to me. Otherwise, I'll be on my boat. Like, don't bother to talk to me. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the decentralized IT leader is effectively doing. A matrix IT leader is doing that, but also, like, saying, okay, you have to do it this way. Yeah. 
So the just... the well, I think you know what what Mike is sort of driving at. I think what I, I, I agree with Mike. I think you know any model works. You hire the right people, the models can work, right? I think in a purely decentralized model, what you're looking for is truly a vision person, right, at the head there, yes, right? Person, yeah. And they are they are truly removed from the day-to-day -day operations, right? And what how do you get there is you know, what's important is the people, right? So if you're going to have 12 CIOs, right? You got to make sure you bring the right people in, Absolutely. right? Because yeah. they're 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 taking that vision for you and they're putting that on the screen, they're putting that on the paper. They're you know whatever that product is that you're delivering. Yeah. Um that that's so what you know it sort of harkens back to something you said earlier in in the cast here which is, you know, training, you know, and people. Yeah. And that's the most important part of all of this, you know. Sure. Uh if you don't have good people, regardless whether they're, you know, ego driven or, you know, egoless, right? Um you're going to be in a problem, you know. It's going to oh. be a world of hurt. Um, and so a purely decentralized model, I think it could be very effective, you know, for all the reasons that you mentioned uh, in, in, in the, you know, earlier in, in the cast here where you're talking about the pros and the cons, you know, those pros are phenomenal. You yeah. want those things, right? Yep. And I think we can manage the cons, to yep. your point, through policy, through training and attracting the right talent. So what if in a decentralized model yep. then, so... Uh, it's almost like I paid you to say that. What if in a, in a decentralized <laughs> IT model then, the, the, this figurehead, this visionary, this mm. sort of leader is stating, okay, uh, you're, you have a functional business unit. You have to get things done. Here's the governance under which we're going to do it. Like I'm going to take care of the governance piece. Like, I'm not going to set the IT vision. I'm actually going to go a different direction. So Mike, Nathan, uh, you have your respective I, IT units, Asia Pac, North America, you're doing great, doing whatever you're doing. But no matter what, I always want you to both follow the same process. Yes. And I always want to see your OKRs, your metrics, your FOMs every month, and they should always be on this particular line. Yes. That's my governance. Like, right. And you're going to always do the same projects the same way. Like, okay. That would be... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's exactly yeah. what I'm saying. Is that, that CIO does have to have some, or super CIO needs to have some sort of ownership of the overall governance plan for the company it's not each group has their own i think that that's one of the things that kind of differentiate and it might be country by country because there's different rules and laws and yep. everything else but i think um yeah I, I agree i agree i think it can be hugely effective i think there is in a small we're talking more small medium business i think it's a little more challenging uh, to 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 pull that off i think in a small medium business it's Less likely you'd have decentralized IT yes, at all. Yes, agreed. Probably go with centralized right. matrix or matrix. Matrix. Right. Yeah, I probably matrix. matrix. Very yeah. po possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very popular. Yeah, and it, if you if regions are so important, you know, you oh, could cool. you could you map this back to things that we're managing every yeah. day in our environments, right? Socks, what it might not be. I mean, you know, the differentiation between the the legal requirement in Spain versus Italy, yeah. right? Yeah. And understanding that at an intimate level and being able to guide, right, is you know, critical to ensure that your filings are on time and things are occurring on time, right? The last thing you want to be seen is the person holding up the, sh the, the yes. ship, right? So, 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 so I think, you know, if you're going to go a true decentralized model, you really need to take a step back and, and understand if you're a regional player, are you a local player? And what does that mean from a, from a policy or, 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 you know, uh, you know, process standpoint, right? So you know, agree. what if in a decentralized model or a matrix model or even yep. a centralized model, you took the project management out of IT, you created, or the business created, and IT to a degree participated in this creation, but the business created a project management structure that brought IT in, in the case of decentralized, of course, brought in all the fun functional units into a broader broader structure. Mm -hmm. But even in a small company, had project management not reside within IT, yep. but had IT play a major role in the governance. So how, so, Let's, I mean, we're talking about decentralized IT because yeah. I think that's the most compelling case. So either from that perspective or another, how do you make it so that IT can, can have a major stake in project governance and project prioritization, project process, but without having project management reside within IT? I, I think that as an IT leader at any organization, most uh, leadership is going to come to you to ask for a lot of the particulars around an IT project, regardless of the, the process. But I think it gives you the opportunity when that discussion happens in your first you know, week or two 
to really in instill some of the confidence in them that you have a procedure that you want to follow. Yeah. And uh, you have information and artifacts that you're going to provide to show them along the way. You may not own the process, but by setting an example early on, they might want you to <laughs> they might want you to do more. And it's a question of whether or not you want you want to be able to get the IT projects done within a certain framework. I mean, a lot of times Agile is introduced by IT. And that is a game changer for businesses that go totally agile. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, is a great on-ramp to how you can potentially not need centralized project management or a big PMO. Let the PMOs run the programs, the drug programs and the launches and that type of thing, and then have sort of this middle ground sort of agile community mm. of project managers that can, um, can, can sort of do what you're saying, Nate. You don't necessarily have it in IT but you have a community of project managers, which you mentioned kind of earlier on in, in your pros and cons of distributed, um, a decentralized IT. Um, I think there's a, a way in that way. Um, for me, current in the current role, there's a project manage, a program management team, and they've done some outreach to say, where do you need help from us? Where can we help? Um, and they'd be very open to me saying, this is how I want to manage project management, um, but not strict waterfall project management or more so of an open, here's a few artifacts we need to record, here's our timelines, here's our budget, here's our total cost. Nathan, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, you know, I don't want to just become an echo chamber here, right? But I mean, <laughs> it's hard when you find like minds, right? Um, you know, one of the difficulties I've, I've personally experienced in my, my career path and, you know, working specifically within life sciences is that, you know, when you're a small organization, you're that baby co, right, that new co, uh, you're seen as the one stop for everything. Yeah. You're that guy, right? You're the guy. They're, yeah. you're, they're coming to you <laughs> okay. for every yep. single thing, yep. right? Um, and it can put a big burden on you when you're trying to accomplish those year one, year two tasks that you point out in your book, right? You're trying to get to these things because you recognize as that early stage leader that there are certain requirements, right, that are coming down the pike at you, right? And you need to prepare the business. So, you know, you might be looking at platforms to implement. You might be looking at trying to advise and inform the executive leadership team, right, whatever stage they're at. Yeah. Um, you know, I've run into organizations where, you know, it's, 30 people and there's no concept of project management across the board. Um, I've come into companies with 30 people and it is tight, very tight, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I think it's, you know, you need to you sort of, you need to. Well, why is that? Why, what situation did you walk into where it was tight? I was an organization that was moving between uh, phase two, phase three, very rapidly um, with a medical device. Um, and so I had never seen an organization have two people in R&D. Right. And have the rest of the organization be supporting clinical effort, legal, you know, their IT department was two part time contractors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, but the program management teams were strong. Yeah. Right. And so ancillarily speaking, the other departments were using those teams, by the way, yep. the way I'd seen. So program management did exist. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, All it right. did. Yes. Yep. 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 Okay. So we're going to come back to program management, too, a little bit later, because mm -hmm. that's an important function that. Uh, can be very powerful. It could be like skull and bones, you know, in a company. I mean, if you're not careful, it's like we don't talk about. We well, we kind of do. Like in the in chapter two of the book, we talk about key stakeholder interviews. And we start talking about building your foundational plan and who you should talk to. I'm remiss in mentioning that you don't talk to project program management, but you do talk to program management. If there's program management in your company, buy them a six pack, get to know everything about yeah. them. Yeah. Because they get all the info. They already got all. They are way ahead of you. Mm -hmm. um, so to both your points, uh, Nathan, you, you sort of mentioned this uh, in a way that I like. I like the way you said it, Mike. You got there from perspective of there's already going to be potentially program project management or program management in the, in the company. But what we're going to talk about in a moment with the chapter is the fact that there isn't. Mm -hmm. That you're walking in as an N of one into uh, to make IT, and to your point, everyone's like, "Wow, you're you're the genius." Where's your freaking program project management? Like, I need an ERP, so make this work. And you're you got to put something in. You got to like in the first ninety days, first hundred days, even the first half of your your tenure, expect that somebody will come to you and say, "Oh, by the way, we just bought Netsuite." We need you to put it in for us. Or 
we're looking at these <laughs> 10 vendors for uh, XYZ. And by the way, at my last company, I used one of them. So we're just going to go with them. And you're going to hear this. In your key stakeholder interviews, you're going to hear, oh, yeah, my last company, I just used them. So we just thought we'd go with them. Uh, we already talked to them. We have the, I have the terms and contract right here. Can you just sign it for us? Or we already signed it. Or we already signed it. Uh, can you put this in for us? No, we, we need you to support it. We don't have anybody in our department to support it. You're going to hear all of these, right? Yeah. I once was asked to implement an ERP, and the, uh, the, the, in, the actual documentation was in French. Literally in French. Oui, oui. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad you didn't have chat GPT to translate, I translate that on the fly. Yeah. 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 Translate yeah. this document for me. And it should say, it'll say, you are fucked. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> AF on your ERP. So, uh, so decentralized IT, we're going to come right back to this because mm. I'm, in just a second to the magic technology, I'm going to be the chapter. But don't, don't, don't worry about it because... When we come back, what we're going to find out is that our new IT leader has no IT department yet. Maybe maybe one person has no decentralized IT capabilities, uh, exists in the company. It's a, it's a lonely frontier, the only sheriff in town, and has to sort of build this out. Decentralized IT, though, is going to come back in the discussion. We mm -hmm. will keep talking about it. Um, it is an important thing to recognize, and whether you're going to think about taking something out of your IT department and putting it somewhere else, then having that do its own thing and trusting it to, to rely on your process, we'll, we'll sort of bring it, we'll bring, bring back, we'll come back to that. Excellent. Oh, hey there. It's Nate. Uh, it's Monday night. I'm actually reading the chapter uh, of this week's podcast independently, chapter 15 of the Life Sciences IT Survival Guide, which is on governance because it's a long chapter and we have a lot to talk about on Wednesday night. So through the magic of technology, I'll just sort of inject this into the middle of the podcast when the final video comes out. But just note that we're sort of skipping over this part on Wednesday night. Um, we will have a special guest. His name is Nathan Doyle. And Nathan was kind enough to recommend uh, Glendalo Double Barrel Irish Whiskey, which I'm having tonight along with the podcast. If if you're buckling yourself in to listen to this one, I highly recommend pouring yourself a glass of your favorite beverage, kicking back and listening to the wonderful tenor of my voice as I read chapter 15 on governance from the Life Sciences IT Survival Guide. Uh, just a quick note, by the way, before I get started, there's a ton of tables in this chapter and pictures. I'm going to do my best to sort of represent these. Some of them I'll show on the screen for those who are watching this on YouTube, but others I'm just going to do my best to interpret. So hang in there. Okay, you can always go look at the chapter later if you want. There'll be, a, there'll be a link in the podcast notes to see the chapter in the tables. But like I said, just hang in there and we'll get through this together. Okay, here we go. Chapter 15, Governance. Within the first year, even within the first 90 days, you will inevitably cross paths with the genesis of corporate governance in some form. And already we have a footnote in this chapter. Here it is. Throughout chapter 15, I use the words governance and guidance interchangeably. Don't be alarmed. In general, guidance is a policy, reference, or some other document that covers a series of steps necessary to support governance. However, governance is itself also guidance. Don't say you weren't warned. Those early seeds of governance may just be subtle undercurrents in the business culture, but they are there. This is because other leaders in your company have also come from places where governance was a part of their daily lives, and they recognize its value and directly or indirectly brought it with them into your new company. However it may be, they will be facing the same obstacles as you for instantiating governance principles in their areas of focus. For instance, your legal department may only just be starting to consider how to get a grip on managing future patent litigation, while your finance department may be months down the road already in the process of formally documenting financial controls for a SOX audit. The speed at which each team is moving is relative to the available resources, the general emphasis, and pressure on them to implement good governance and their particular position on how fast they should be moving. Wherever the functional lines may be in their respective journeys, 
you have to start constructing the governance that the IT department will need to be successful, and this must start in year one. Why is governance so important for success? Governance answers one of the most critical questions about your fundamental objectives of leadership. How? How will you select the platforms you are going to implement? How will you construct a security technology stack and deploy it? How will you protect corporate data and make sure it is backed up? All of the hows are answered, in effect, through the implementation of governance. If you were to give two football teams a ball, lead them to an open playing surface, and then just blow a whistle but have no goals, no referees, no sidelines, and no clock, the resultant effect is akin to what you would experience if you tried to execute an IT strategy without governance. Provide the how, and all of a sudden you have a formal game with rules, expectations of outcomes, special teams, coordinated plays, a game clock, and even a coach. But you were thinking, damn it, Nate, you just had me write a strategic plan. Isn't that enough? What more do you want from me? Yes, you did write a strategic plan, which is actually one of the expected outcomes of IT governance. In fact, having an IT strategic plan is both a requirement of IT governance and finance governance. The day will come when you need to submit that IT strat plan during a SOX audit as evidence that you understand how to write and how to get approval for an IT plan. Your strat plan answered the what, but it did not provide the guidelines of how. Indeed, you will have gone to some great lengths in your strat plan to define what you will do and the steps needed to do that. But you are thinking, damn it, Nate, I just wrote a strat plan. Isn't that enough? What more do you want from me? Well, yes, you did write a strat plan, which is actually one of the expected outcomes of IT governance. In fact, having an IT strat plan is both a requirement of IT governance and finance governance. The day will come when you need to submit that IT strat plan during a SOX audit as evidence that you understand how to write and get approval for an IT plan. Your strat plan answered the what, but it did not provide the guidelines of how. Indeed, you will probably have gone to some great lengths in your strat plan to define what you will do and the steps needed to do it, but how did you come up with those steps? How are you going to ensure that they are the right steps? You certainly are not just going to close your eyes and throw darts at a board when it comes to selecting the best platforms for the company. So what is the methodology behind all of your choices? That is governance. In a corporation, governance presents itself in so many forms, ranging from the formal to the informal and the hidden to the overt. Governance can be presented as adherence to a state, federal, or global mandate, or it can be something that the company itself mandates as a matter of good business practice. It can even be mandated by a single department. Certain departments in the life science area of companies, which includes IT, do have to create good governance models for their respective methodologies. Though there are some standalone outliers to the common framework of what to expect from good governance in a life sciences company vis-a-vis -vis any other company, I have categorized the bulk of corporate governance in the following six major categories and under each called out the specific areas relative to those categories where you would find governance in its various forms. And I'm going to show a table up here on the screen now. So for the six major areas, you're going to find technology, financial, programs, organizational, process, and corporate compliance. Now, for instance, under technology, you'll see there's prioritization and project management. There's development, infrastructure and operations, security and risk, and there's data management. Under financial, you'll see things like SOX control, reporting, auditing. Under programs, you'll see portfolio strategy, business development, commercial, awareness and engagement. Under organizational, you'll see things like enterprise risk management and business continuity, perhaps even culture and M&A. Under process compliance, you'll see quality compliance, medical, legal, and regulatory compliance. Under corporate compliance, you'll see intellectual property and patent compliance, contract management, and whistleblower and ethics compliance. 
So as we can see within the technology category, which I just mentioned, we have five main areas of governance. Now, while IT has its proprietary areas of governance in which it must create standards for operation, IT also plays a role in almost every other area of governance in the company. In some specific areas of the business, IT actually plays more than just a bit part. So I've noted those areas above in the table, along with a brief description below, which I'll read now. So for SOX control management, where does IT play a role? Well, in proof of controls, artifact retrieval, control mitigation, and platform implementation. For enterprise risk management, information security response and data management. For business continuity, well, of course, continued access to data and platforms in the event of an emergency. For quality compliance, well, in the life sciences industry, it's 21 CFR 11 adherence, computer system validation, quality control, and GXP. Under contract management, you might have a CLMS platform, electronic signature management, and even data management, and so on and so forth. For this chapter, however, I would like to place the emphasis squarely on our IT leaders' shoulders and discuss IT governance that is to be led by IT. And here I have a footnote. When the time is ready, those other functions that require IT's input into their governance will come calling for IT's assistance. In year one, it is not practical for all of these to be implemented, as some just won't be needed yet. And for the ones that are implemented, it is likely that only certain aspects will be launched, while others will remain on hold until the business matures further in years two and three or further down the road. And I have called these different aspects out accordingly. Those that will remain nascent or not fully matured until years two or three will be further detailed later on in this book. By the way, this is an immense chapter, so I have distilled it down to the respective five groups noted in the table above. Conceivably, this chapter could be its own damn book. And in fact, it was. Until I consolidated it into this chapter. Take it one step at a time, but do not, under any circumstances, neglect the importance of governance in your mission. So let's start with prioritization and project management. And let's go back in time and reflect on the key stakeholder meetings. The chances are excellent that you heard at least one key stakeholder say something to the effect of, well, at my last company, we used platform XYZ. So I already talked to the vendor there that I know about using XYZ here. Not to worry, as this is somewhat of an expected refrain. Your key stakeholders may have enjoyed success with a particular platform or a piece of software at their previous company. Still, they are unlikely to remember that at their last company, they also had an IT department of maybe 30 people or employed dedicated staff and their function for platform administration. Your key stakeholders statement is not one to take lightly, especially if they have already spoken to the vendor. Still, it's a good idea. It's a good indicator of where their mind is in terms of expectations for their functional area in the business. Having good IT governance, especially as it relates to project prioritization and project management, will be the guiding principle behind your following response. That is wonderful. I look forward to speaking with the vendor and looking with you, both at your selection process and the broader industry, to see if perhaps there are vendors even better suited to align with our business strategy, resources, and long-term plan. Now, overall, when it comes to prioritizing anything, you have to account for the three primary assets which can assist with your prioritization. The short asset list includes three very objective measure, measurements of availability, time, resources, and money. In any given strategic paradigm, corporate or real life, you can only ever get anything done if you have the proper balance of each. Now let's digress for a moment and talk about the actual numbers behind resources, specifically as it relates to availability. Now over the years, the IT departments that I have had the great fortune to lead I've always loved the fact, and this is a footnote, by loved, I mean hated, that I routinely reminded them of exactly how many days were left in a given fiscal year almost every week. I did not remind them so much as to be a lording pain in the ass, but because time, as a resource, is too often disregarded as infinitely expendable. In fact, 
time is the greatest delimiter of the three assets. Here is why. In a fiscal calendar year, a company can only count on an average of about 255 available working days for every employee. If you subtract three weeks of vacation, this leaves 240 days. If you subtract one week of training or conferences, this leaves 235. And if you subtract, say, five days for sick or personal, this leaves about 230 possible working days. But let's be honest with each other for a moment and say what we all know is true. The eight-hour day is a thing of the past. And again, I have a footnote, though what has replaced it is not very good. I uncovered some disturbing data from the U.S. Department of Labor about the average productive working hours per day being somewhere around two and a half hours. Now, this is 2020 data, but if we, even if we sort of marginally assume that it's gone up, it probably hasn't gone up by very much. So for the sake of keeping the math to a nominal state of background noise here, let's just stay with the notion that eight is still the number of hours your employees actually work in a day. That means there's eight hours that during all eight hours, they are working. There's no break. They're just working for eight hours a day. This means that with 230 possible working days, you and your resources each have about 1,840 hours to get everything done in a fiscal year. Seems like a big number, doesn't it? Well, when we first created our IT strategic plan, we created an extensive list of tactical goals to move the business forward. Those goals, however, just don't happen on their own. They need at least one person in IT to either do them or oversee those that do. In all likelihood, and this is a number I have arrived at with more than a score of years of experience behind me, the IT-specific actions in your strategic plan those that are IT projects only and not aligned with the business, capture roughly 60% or what would be about 1,100 hours of your overall available departmental time per employee. Since this 1,100 hours does not include the time set aside for implementing new platforms for the business, the amount of time available to support, implement, and improve business-specific technologies is about 700 hours or about 88 days of availability. And if we take the data that suggests that you will spend an average of five hours per week in meetings, again, there's a footnote here, and I follow this big study from Ask Cody. There's a footnote in the actual document. You can read all about it. But it stipulates that the average employee spends about five hours per week in meetings. Uh, for some of us, it's four times that. Um, for others, they're fortunate to be less. But let's just go with five. You can further knock down that number to about 600 hours. Now, I will not include all the hours lost to distractions, drive-bys, spilled coffee, quick trips to the kitchen to be the first in line for pizza leftovers. 600 hours is a pretty good estimate of how much time each person in IT can reasonably return back to productivity to the business per year. Again, not IT operations, business-specific operations. Again, it still seems like a significant number, but it isn't. It's about 75 working days or about one-third of total annual work hours. Now, how do you prioritize the 1,100 hours needed for IT goals versus the 600 available for business goals? Ostensibly, your 1,100 hours are related to business goals. However, they only play supporting roles in carrying the functional line initiatives forward. Granted, one of your key objectives in your IT strat plan may be a single platform implementation for a functional line, but even in that case, the model still holds true. You will have X hours allocated to the IT strat plan and Y hours available to the rest of the business. With all this in mind, and thinking back upon our key stakeholder who used platform XYZ at their last company, we now recognize that there is a clearly, there's clearly a potential value in aiding them in accomplishing their project, objective. After all, they have demonstrated that the implementation and use of that platform leads to an important milestone for the business. However, after talking to the vendor for Platform XYZ, we soon come to find out that Platform XYZ will consume close to half of our available resources in terms of hours for the whole year in just four months. When you put pencil to paper, what quickly becomes apparent is that if you blindly moved forward with the key stakeholders need, at least one, but most likely a few other functions in the business will not achieve their goals, which may also happen to be important milestones. Now, that was a lot of math, 
So I'm going to have a drink. Math makes me thirsty. Okay, so what the hell am I doing with all this math? This is not a math book. Well, this math is why project prioritization as a paradigm of governance becomes so essential in terms of saving the day. Project prioritization allows you to develop a system of rank that supersedes opinion and ensures that the most important platforms are prioritized based on the three available assets, time, money, and people, relative to the business's needs. Though we have established that time is the most critical of the three assets, you do also have to account for the available budgeted funds, which themselves are finite. We've already gone through this. And the availability of resources from the functional lines, also finite. And in a growing life sciences company, pretty rare. Even if IT does have the available resources to implement a platform, and even if there is enough time and money, the functional line itself still also needs to provide resources for their roles in the project. Again, this is why to execute a plan successfully, you need governance. You need, a, you need a clear and objective method to adjudicate the three assets appropriately among IT and the business's competing needs. So what does that method look like? Well, before we can begin to rank any technological priorities and provide a basis for the strength of those ranks, we need to define our governance by developing the following. A charter structure and the assemblance of a committee that will formally oversee prioritization. Criteria that the committee will use to determine what projects need to be ranked. A formal method for assessing vendors and requirements. Criteria that the committee can use to perform the project prioritization ranking. A process to formally submit the ranking arrived at by the committee to an executive body for approval, a process allowing the committee to reprioritize on a recurring schedule, methods to continuously assess performance against those who were previously approved, approved for prioritization, and lastly, a transparent and effective means of communication to the business for the entire process. Now, as with most corporate governance models, invariably some phenotypic committee will be adjourned to preside over the maintenance and execution of this governance. And here I have a footnote. In IT, the three most likely committees to evolve due to governance are prioritization, statutory compliance, and information security and risk. Now, committees do many things to uphold governance, not the least of which is ensuring or trying to ensure unilateral fairness. Ensuring fairness, especially when it comes to governance that oversees prioritizing which functional lines get approval or not, is of course essential. I won't belabor all the details of the eight points above, but I do want to take a moment to focus on two of them. Assembling a committee and formalizing a method for requirements and assessments. Now, when it comes time to create a committee, and it's likely that IT will be responsible for creating such a committee because it is a technological prioritization committee. You want to strive to not only bring together the correct number of people to help administer the governance, but also to bring in the right types of people who understand how the various functions and processes in the life sciences company work in unison. And this applies to companies of all industries. In consideration of what an ideal committee member would look like, I've created a diagram, which I will now show up on the screen for you. Now, looking at this diagram, there are six basic phenotypical characteristics that we want to sort of go after for employees. We have organization. And underneath organization I've written has been previously employed in a company that has attempted to or gone public or attempted to do or commercialized a product. Under R&D and regulatory, conceptually at least, this person is aware of the R&D life cycle. Ideas to trials to submission to approval. And all the resources required and nuances involved. Under compliance, we have this person has participated in, or at least been on the receiving end of, compliance-related initiatives that compel adherence to regulations. Under personal growth, this person aspires to grow 
a career within a life sciences company, and is analytically minded and very fast and a very fast learner. Under commercialization, this person understands the commercialization life cycle from research to clinical to manufacturing to commercial and the myriad steps in between. And lastly, under manufacturing, has at least a basic understanding of how our products are made and what the supply chain consists of, especially with the internal resources. Now, there's a very low likelihood of you finding and recruiting large populations of individuals like this, at least in the earlier stages of growth in a life sciences company. Furthermore, it is likely that those you do find that meet the criteria are probably already on several committees or have other time commitments because of how much they know and their likely position in the company. Therefore, sometimes you have to make do with what is available to you. I recommend that if resources are tough to come by to assist you in your governance plan, try to at least match three of the six criteria, but no less than two. Even if one of those is considerable strength in the personal growth area, Incidentally, if you find yourself in a situation where it is just not possible to form a committee, this does not mean you are excused from prioritization. Join forces with the CFO and anyone else who you can find, and while you await more resources to become available, at least the two or three of you can execute the prioritization process by yourselves. Now, before any requests can come to the committee for consideration, you need to establish a formal process for building requirements and assessing platforms and vendors. We talked about this in the eight steps above. Now, without a formal process for technology selection, the company will ultimately end up with what is known as technological debt. Technological debt comes from the ad hoc selection of technology based on subjective, generally borderline specious criteria bolstered by, this is what I used in my last company logic. Technological debt is a gradual amassing of platforms and technology that no one can fully utilize because the original purpose was never truly established and no model for, for perpetual care and feeding was created. While not a specific remit of IT or the business, though it should be, avoiding technological debt is the implicit backdrop for your IT prioritization governance. Prioritization initiatives based on impact of the company and careful avoidance or minimization of technical debt ensures that the most appropriate decisions are made for the long-term positive maturity of the company's technology. You can utilize a chart like this, and I'm about to show it on the screen, to help you understand how any investment in technology is likely or not to contribute to your technological debt. So under the question of resources and time, does the business have the necessary resources to implement, train, and administer this platform? Under funding, has the technology addition been appropriately budgeted for? And under priority, is this technology investment necessary to support a strategic business goal? And back to resources and time, does IT have the necessary resources to implement and support it? Under funding, has the long-term care and feeding been budgeted for, including resources and risk avoidance? Under priority, does the business avoid risk or non-compliance by acquiring this technology? And is there a redundancy in place to prevent loss of institutional knowledge of this technology? Has the business properly accounted for incidental or unseen costs? And is the business able to stop the technology if it is deemed to be non-essential in the future? Therefore, understanding this table from a high-level perspective here is what your formal process should contain in order. One, an initial discussion with the key stakeholders about their technological needs leading to gathering requirements using a formal functional requirements specification, also known as an FRS, but sometimes called a URS with the U standing for user. Number two, a vendor long list, which is a list of all known vendors that on paper would seem to meet the requirements for who will be included in the RFP process. A formal RFP or request for a proposal, which is built using the FRS data, is sent to those vendors who seem to meet the requirements. During this time, a project team is also assembled, the formal group which will be responsible for the implementation. 
Number five, a vendor scorecard is used to empirically grade each vendor who presents against the RFP and how closely they match the requirements. Number six, a vendor shortlist, which is the remaining list of vendors who successfully pass through the RFP process. Number seven, a business proposal containing the elements of the FRS. It will be presented to your prioritization committee along with a breakdown of expected costs, return on value, risks, benefits, resources, alternatives, and time commitments. And lastly, a single vendor platform ranked as the ideal candidate is selected based on all information gathered. This process then dovetails into the remainder of the cycle of prioritization governance. The steering committee leader, most likely you, will present the steering committee's assessment of how the submitted business proposals ranked in order of importance to the business or to the executive team. The executive team is then empowered to accept the committee's recommendations or challenge the rankings by either asking for more information or, based on the information they have, proposing new rankings back to the committee. In any case, the ultimate result is that there is a formal prioritization yield, the functional lines are notified, and all candidates are expected to accept the prioritization and carry on with or without their projects. Incidentally, any formal prioritization acceptance does not mean that those who are approved are simply free to go. They will need to continuously come back to the prioritization committee throughout the life cycle of their technology's existence. This allows the candidates to report back on progress to ensure that the platform aligns with what was presented and agreed upon as the original scope. Further, any deprioritized groups can potentially be reprioritized if, for instance, a previously approved project needs to be canceled or fails to deliver adequately. If an already approved platform requires an update or changes large enough in scope to require a new proposal, that will also require a return to the committee. While functional groups in IT may meet at any point in the year to develop a functional requirement specification, I strongly encourage you, the IT leader, to ensure that the prioritization committee develops and publishes a schedule of meetings to the business. This lets the business know when the committee will hear any new requests for business and hear readouts concerning the status of currently approved and ongoing projects. Ensure that your prioritization committee meetings align with any budget reforecasts and any other quarterly milestones when strat priorities may change. Absent an FTE who can manage a decentralized project management office, also known as a DPMO, which is generally a concept for much more mature stature companies, the role of IT project management will fall upon the shoulders of you, the IT leader. Platforms such as Asana can significantly assist with this endeavor. These platforms will allow you to plot out a course for the year and beyond as needed to ensure that projects are managed across the groups and the overall portfolio is kept in a single location. It is also a remit of the prioritization committee to determine which criteria will be used when deciding if a technological project will or will not be required to come forward to the committee or be budgeted and handled outside of a prioritization process. Not every technological project will require a proposal before the committee. Your committee would want to develop a threshold matrix that looks something like this. All projects must come before the prioritization committee when any of these conditions is true. One, when the threshold of the internal and external resources for hours exceeds X. Two, when the threshold of a contract, SAO, or combination of both exceeds X. Three, when the project directly supports the achievement of a strategic goal. Four, when the project substantially creates or mitigates a current enterprise risk. And five, when the magnitude of technological change substantially impacts the operations of the business. As a matter of best practice and to ensure fairness and transparency, IT projects that answer yes to the committee's questions above must also come before the committee. By establishing effective project prioritization governance, you can begin to detail how a decision to do X versus Y unfolds. Further, you are involving the business in technological decision making, which continues along our theme of making IT a core competency for the overall business. Now, the implementation of the project itself is the other side of the governance coin, so to speak. 
good prioritization governance is not in any way predicated on the assertion that the individuals who are implementing the approved and prioritized projects have an established sense of how to implement the technology. Again, we come back to the word how. Per the governance's prioritization aspect, they are required to report back frequently on the status of the implementation and utilization of their platform. Ideally, when they report back the news, it will be positive reporting that they are on time, on budget, and adhering to their proposed resource plan. Deviations from any of these may not necessarily indicate poor project management, as spontaneous events do tend to occur to waylay even the best plans. However, any deviation should be understood and a mitigation plan established. Good project management comes in many different forms and is mostly an ideological construct. Bespoke IT project managers and corporate project managers in general come from a variety of different schools of thought and training. Some may be entirely reliant on a PMP methodology, or PIMBOK. Others may rely on a waterfall or agile approach or something more akin to lean. You will find amalgamations of many project management types compacted together to complement one another through various project stages. Some project managers can carry multiple industry certifications and be absolutely abysmal at the role, while others who have no certifications at all can have track records of incredible project performance. I will not spend the time delving into all the major forms of project management. There are too many good books already written on the subject. I do want to touch briefly on the governance aspects, though, and highlight the importance of responsible project management rigor, which I have written in the chart below. And I will show this up on the screen. For project stage of proposal, the purpose of this is to advise the business as to the purpose, expected outcomes, resources needed, and timelines. This is effectively your change management process. Governance applicability? Well, this is the big one because it answers both the how and why for technological investment. For vendor selection, what's the purpose? Well, you want to select a vendor based on objective data, not because I used them at my last company. Governance applicability? Well, it prevents tech debt and ensures the best alignment with business strategy. For the project stage of vendor management, well, the purpose is it keeps the vendors honest throughout the contract negotiation and implementation phase. Governance applicability, well, it ensures vendor accountability. I mean, bottom line, and it helps in preventing scope creep, delays, misdirection, and deceitful practices. For implementation, the purpose it defines start and go live dates as well as milestones in between. It assigns resources appropriately and creates actions based on dependencies. For governance, well, it provides the full scope of activities, sets a clear expectation of deliverables to the business. Now I'm going to jump down to the postmortem because we haven't talked about postmortems yet. But the opportunity for the project team at a postmortem is to assess its performance after the project. Now they have lots of terms for this. I like postmortem despite the uh, ghoulishness of it because, in fact, you are going over something that's now in the past and effectively done. Postmortems are an essential element of business improvement and allow teams to openly assess how well the team performed without fear of recrimination. And that's the key. Now, this isn't in the book, but I'll tell you that anecdotally, I've seen successful postmortems where everybody in the room was able to properly say how other people screwed up without fear of recrimination. And it's a form in which you should be able to do this. That's the beauty of a postmortem. If done right and led by um, a seasoned person, you can actually make sure that the next time you do a project, it's fantastic. So as you can see, a well-structured project management process, in this case, related to a technology implementation, has direct implications on the quality of IT governance for prioritization. Functional lines that continuously demonstrate responsible governance through effective project management practices reap the rewards each time they have to come back to the prioritization committee. In fact, I've worked at companies where functional lines that consistently perform poorly have been required to be trained by functional lines that do an excellent job. Makes sense. One last important note for you to consider is how much project management is the right amount of project management for you to introduce. You do not want to walk in on day one and detail your program for establishing a centralized project management office, also known as a CPMO. If you come out swinging that hard, you will alienate your customers 
And of course, they'll think you're batshit crazy, and they will turn against your entire governance model. Plus, they will probably think you have no touch with reality. Take a more straightforward approach. While it is advisable to use the chart above, make sure to take the time to walk the business into this model of implementing technology one step at a time. One way that I have found, which works wonders in terms of getting customer buy-in to the model, is to partner with any functional lines who will be coming forward with a proposal and take whatever time is needed to help them write their first FRS. Don't write the whole thing for them, but go ahead, go ahead and go above and beyond to help them iterate the FRS by providing examples, testing their theories, and ultimately making it an inscrutable document for the committee. They will appreciate your efforts, and they will now have a document upon which they can build their proposal and RFP quite quickly. Prioritization and good project management go hand in hand when it comes to idealizing the project prioritization approach of governance. That's a mouthful. However, in some companies, it is entirely possible that you simply won't need to instantiate the full scope of this type of governance in year one. It just may be that you do not have any projects which might fall into the scope of prioritization, or the business may just be too young. It could also be dependent on the time of year. This is completely fine, and in fact, is more of the norm than the exception. Find the most balanced approach, but do make an effort to gradually introduce these concepts into the business, at least before your first significant project gets underway. As more and more projects come forward, introducing this form of governance does increase in complexity. Now, in terms of development, at some particular stage between years one and three, you will have a need for internal development. That development may come in the form of writing or using basic APIs and webhooks, or it may be significantly more complicated, such as developing an internally built enterprise application. Even something as fundamentally basic as integrating your new platform with an electronic signature platform could create a development moment and fall within the scope of development governance. Regardless of the complexity of the development lifecycle you are facing, having a governance model in place will ensure that any scale of development is performed in a documented, secure, repeatable, and stable way. Now, in the event that some aspect of development already exists in the company when you land there, the creation of development governance is an advantageous opportunity for you to not only understand the business needs of the developers, but to also work with them to create the foundation for development governance, using what has already been done as the baseline. By incorporating the building blocks we will discuss below, you can work with the developers to create a framework that ensures the integrity of the development lifecycle and makes the developers' lives easier by providing them with a set of common controls by which to operate. Do not ignore the situation if you find that there are already developers hard at work at your company. You do need to partner up and make sure there is some level of control in place. Now, development of any kind comes with inherent risk. The risk doesn't so much scale in proportion to the complexity of the development as it does with the type of development being actually undertaken. The aim of your governance model is to provide a set of specifications that attempt to de-risk any development, regardless of its complexity or type. Should a Slack webhook be retreated on the same scale as a credit card web form? Yes and no. I mean, yes, each should be evaluated equally against the governance framework, but no, each will most likely result in a different set of treatment and scrutiny. In this section, we will largely focus on creating development governance where development of any kind does not yet formally exist. And in doing so, we want to keep in mind that, much like you wouldn't want to walk in on day one and turn your company into a mature PMO, you should also lower your expectations similarly for the rollout of development governance in the first year. Walking in and declaring, we are now an agile shop, we'll be using two-week sprints from here on out, will, once again, rapidly alienate your customer base. Smartly stepping into development governance is the optimal way to go to ensure a model that employees can understand and thrive in. Now, unlike the other forms of governance that we will discuss later, which have myriad forms, policies, and intersections of thought, development governance is generally guided by a core principle known as the Software Development Lifecycle Process, or SDLC. Now, there are methodologies that will complement and even sit atop a reliable SDLC program, such as OWASP's Software Assurance Maturity Model, or CMMI. Still, they will generally not stand alone. 
they do not complement poorly constructed SDLC processes. Further, using an additional methodology such as SAM is most likely a down-the-road item that you will begin to consider as your development program matures. A well-written SDLC will not ascribe itself to one specific type of development since the company may use multiple types of development. For instance, one group uses Agile, one uses Waterfall, and so on. The ultimate aim of the SDLC is to provide a universal set of guidelines that ensures the highest level of customer satisfaction by adequately building and testing the readiness of any product for release. The word product denotes anything from a simple web UI change to a new API behavior to a fully functional application. If you want to understand the basics of what an SDLC should include, have a look at the Wikipedia entry for SDLC. Here you can see the 10 phases of an SDLC most commonly found today. Some companies distill this down to seven or eight steps. In contrast, others will expand this process. They'll either expand the requirements through the development phase to include several intermittent steps or more depending on their software quality testing models. There also needs to be a compliance element within your SDLC, which details, in the case of life sciences companies, how GXP impacts software or is controlled through a series of change control steps. These steps are in addition to the steps I mentioned above. I have worked in companies with two distinct SDLC processes, which were processes related to validated software environments and those in non-validated software environments. While it is not mission critical to have two distinct policies, the outcome will ultimately be determined through your partnership with your quality department. The SDLC, much like the overall development governance, is a documented process that will mature in time. Do you need a fully functional corporate SDLC on day one? Absolutely not. Should you wait until a functional line needs some substantial development and then write the SDLC? Also, substan no. The SDLC, much like the overall development The SDLC, much like the overall development governance, is a documented process that will mature in time. Do you need a fully functional corporate SDLC on day one? No. Should you wait until a functional line needs some substantial development and then write the SDLC? Also, no. And that's a hard no. Begin the process of socializing the SDLC concept within the business, especially to those customers most likely to require some type of development shortly after your first 90 days. In this day and age, that can be done by just about anyone. Still, you will come to find out in the first 90 days and through your stakeholder interviews, which groups are most likely to consume technology at a scale that would require development versus groups that will simply use what the rest of the company is using. So suppose you find enough willing participants, for instance, citizen developers and business developers. In that case, you can even form an SDLC committee whose remit it is to develop the SDLC and meet on a recurring basis to discuss ongoing corporate development. This is especially important if the range of development is broad within the business. It provides an essential level of transparency that will help prevent rogue development and be used to ensure adherence and potentially even reward the overall development experience. Now, in terms of creating and maturing your SDLC program, below is an SDLC maturity index that I have put together that aligns with your company's first three years. And I'll show this up on the screen. In terms of creating and maturing your SDLC program, below is an SDLC maturity index that I have put together that aligns with your new company's first three years, and I'll show this on the screen. It makes some assumptions about your development environment as it relates to 2021 and beyond. Now, keep in mind, this book is a little over three years old, hence the date. Still relevant, though. It could be that your experience in maturing governance is faster or slower, so you would accelerate or decelerate as needed. The matrix also assumes that you either have an FTE or more in your roadmap or that you have accounted for third-party consulting dollars in your budget for one or more development projects. Now, I'm not going to read this entire chart, but it will give you the periods of time. So months 0 through 12 would be the crawling phase. Months 13 through 24 would be standing. And here, just to give you an idea of where we are in the process, we have some basic test methodologies in place. Months 25 through 36, you're in the walking phase. In terms of process, you have some good capabilities now. You can do load testing, 
You can do automated testing. You even have QA collaboration in place. Months 37 through 48, you're now in the running phase. You have secure development processes introduced, such as DevSec, and you have usability testing implemented. And then lastly, for months 48 plus, for your process while well, you're killing it. So now you're introducing risk management and it oversees all testing through deployment of all development. In year one, it is also essential you ask questions about and pay special attention to the business areas where API utilization is probable. Peel back the layers of any platforms in use and determine if there are already basic development instances. Look for low code, no code environments, also known as LCNC. And these are called things like Zapier, AppSheet, and IFTTT. Most of the SaaS apps in use at your company will have an API component, REST most likely, that is exposed by default. So dig in and find out what's going on. You need to do this before basic API usage suddenly becomes production essential API usage and you are unable to rein in progress. Now for the next area of governance, infrastructure and operations, We'll be focusing on establishing governance in several key areas, key areas of IT, namely public and private cloud environment management, data backup and restoration, physical access for on-premise infrastructure, change control policy and management, and IT services and support. There are other more specific areas of infrastructure and operation governance areas, such as routine operations and alert reporting, which I won't spend time on here. Those are either superseded by one of the above or they are a routine practice within IT as a matter of doing business. Further, in year one, you will most likely only start to deploy your INO governance in the form of change control and aspects related to business continuity, such as data backup, physical controls, and remote access. Physical controls and remote access, it should be said, are both a part of INO governance in as much as security governance. In fact, of the three remaining areas of IT governance we will cover, Infrastructure and Operations, INO, Security, Risk, and Compliance, Data Management, there are significant overlaps and dependencies between each of them. While it is ostensibly true that the previously covered development governance also overlaps with these three, primarily because the SDLC required in development is entirely dependent on how these three governance areas interoperate, I will leave it as a standalone area of governance for now. But wait, there is more. There is one other interstitial area of governance that falls somewhere between development and operations. I mentioned it before, but it is known as DevOps or DevSecOps, depending on your role. Sometime between 2002 and 2009, the term DevOps became part of the standard IT vernacular. No one knows precisely, though, um, although Wikipedia authors seem to push that date more towards the latter time. DevOps has come to mean many things to many people. It has spawned an entire industry. Even huge conferences devoted to arguing about who is more important, development or operations. I'm not going to wax philosophical on what DevOps is or is not. Suppose you successfully mature your development, security, and infrastructure domains over the next three years. In that case, you'll be ready for the big time, and you can roll out your amazingly innovative DevOps governance strategy that's fit for you. As DevOps governance is born out of the other governance models we will discuss, we will move on. I mean, geez, we're only still in year one. Now, I'm going to show this up on the screen. But if we were to visualize where the most essential overlap occurs between the three areas mentioned above, we would see a Venn diagram that probably looks something like this. Now, what I've done is three circles, one's for infrastructure and operations, one's for data management, and one is for security, risk, and compliance. And when you overlap them in the middle, you get controls. Now, using the term controls is slightly ambiguous, but it does convey the central thesis of the governance. Let's take a look at physical controls, for instance. If I have a need to ensure that only certain people are able to access a certain locked cage in the data center to perform systems administration on a certain server to allocate more storage space, I will need to address that need according to the following governance. Number one, I and O settings, which specify the correct physical device along with all of its current configuration settings on any given day and guidance to go with that. I know guidance on how to properly test changes in a test environment before rolling into production. Both a security and I and O guidance mechanism, which states who can badge in the data center, who can also use a physical key to open the cage. Security guidance 
that provides details on who may access that specific server, along with guidance as to how to see the credentials, data management guidance on how to properly allocate space while retaining data integrity and how to classify the new storage space appropriately, and lastly, data management guidance on how to test to ensure that after space has been allocated, the prior data is unaffected. It seems exhausting, and I'm just actually going to take a drink here because I'm getting thirsty just reading that. Yum. But take heart in the fact this is by no means your definitive outlook for year one. Year two may even be a stretch for some younger companies in terms of having this entire process constructed. You and your partner will undoubtedly craft these guidelines as the business matures and finds that it needs controls where none currently exist. So let's get started by diving into the five main areas of infrastructure and operations governance, which will most likely need to appear in year one, whether as mandates of overarching compliance or by virtue of complexity. They are, one, public and private cloud environment management, two, data backup and restoration, three, physical management for any on-premise infrastructure, four, change management, and five, IT services. Now, when it comes to governance in the public and private cloud environment management area, I feel that it is better to break this down into two distinct areas of control guidance creation. One, guidance for the administration of SaaS applications, which either store data or act as brokers of data en route from A to B. Or two, guidance for the operations and management of compute environments, such as Google Cloud and AWS. Though they share common aspects of guidance, especially related to access control, each also has its requirements for creating sound governance principles. In the chart below, I have broken down the essential information you will want to make sure you cover with the guidance in year one. Keep in mind that there are additional elements you may add later to ensure even more comprehensive governance. For instance, under security, for SaaS applications that control data en route from A to B, You'll want controls to ensure the SaaS platforms behave according to standard practices. This can include SOC 2, ISO, SSAE 18 audits, or documentation review. Now for access controls, for data that's transferred from A to B, you'll want controls to ensure that the least privileged model of access is enforced. Service accounts are used wherever possible. Lockout standards are in place, as well as anomalous behavior detection and prevention protocols. Now, I'm going to show this table up on the screen uh, so you can better see this. Under maintenance for administration of SaaS applications, which either store data or act as brokers, unless there's a secondary FAT client, for instance, Google Drive, maintenance controls are limited and focused on ensuring access vehicles, for instance, Chrome, are updated to the most secure versions whenever in a session. There are several other examples in this table, and I recommend that you read this when you get the chance. I will bookmark this in the notes for the podcast. Now, under data backup and restoration, a single comprehensive backup and restoration policy will generally satisfy your needs for this aspect of corporate data management governance insofar as state, federal, and global mandates are concerned. Effectively, so long as you can realistically satisfy the question, can we back up our critical data and restore it to its original state if needed, then your policy is most likely a sound one. Now, I have a footnote here. If you feel that it's necessary to split out your policies into separate mandates, for instance, backup policy, restoration policy, retention policy, that is also fine. Keep in mind that you will eventually need to align your backup policy with its counterpart, a corporate data retention instruction policy, which enters the scene a bit further down the road. The data retention and instruction policy is something you may end up co-authoring in year one, and you would most likely do this alongside your general counsel. The funny thing about this policy is it tends to never get past the draft stage in life sciences companies, which is a shame because generally by the time you desperately need it, for instance, your first lawsuit, it's too late to implement. Furthermore, if you are a company that is accountable for satisfying GDPR controls, you also need to have a corresponding set of policies that demonstrate your capabilities to destroy your archival data. For now though, let's focus on the backup and restoration policy. We will address data retention, GDPR, etc. further on in this book. Your backup and restoration policy will want to include at least the following seven domains of guidance. Quality, ubiquity, functionality, notifications and failures, 
access and restoration, and here I have a few notes. You should be able to answer these three main questions. When I need the backup data, will I be able to get it? How precisely will I find the data when I do need it to access the backup? And once I finally found it, will I be able to use it? Now, let's start with an example. I use a SaaS engineering and workflow platform called Lucidchart, which thankfully comes with built-in functionality that provides me with an easy way to schedule backups to Google Drive on a weekly basis, which is Lucidchart's designated time interval. Lucidchart's backup file type is .laf, which is proprietary to that platform. So after each weekly backup occurs to my Google Drive, my primary backup solution then takes over, which allows me to backup my Google Drive data to an AWS S3 environment. Now this occurs on a more frequent basis, daily, and it picks up any deltas and changes. In addition to the weekly backups, the Lucidchart platform also backs up newly created documents immediately. So ultimately, this is what the backup flow looks like, and again, I will show this on the screen. And as you can see, the answers to my three main questions above are yes, unless both Google Drive and AWS are down at the same time. Two, the backup file is labeled by default as lucidchart backup year month day laf So I only need to search on that string with the appropriate date, date inserted. And three, yes, unless lucidchart is completely down. Otherwise, I have no means by which to open the LAF file. As with most of the SaaS platforms I use, this is the norm, not the exception. You can generally only restore the backup files of any SaaS vendor to the original SaaS platform due to their proprietary nature. In the case of Lucidchart, should I ever find myself in a situation where I have a highly critical document that must always be available, even with an outage of their platform, I also have the manual functionality to take on-demand backups in a more standard format, such as PDF or PNG. My approach in the backup guidance is to directly call out these platforms, which have unique file types as their default backup methodology, detail in my guidance how each backup will be performed, and then detail how I will perform manual backups on those documents deemed business critical. Those two will be saved in AWS S3 via Google Drive. It will be universally accessible and platform friendly. Some environments will also save to a friendly format by default, but there will be several caveats included in that backup. For instance, users of the Smartsheet platform know that it will allow for daily backups upon request. Still, it converts your Smartsheet plans into Microsoft Excel documents. Now, even though these are re-importable into Smartsheet, all attachments are stripped out and you lose formatting, though the core data is retained. Furthermore, in the case of Smartsheet, the backup must be downloaded manually from the Smartsheet website, although this can be automated via creative scripting. Other platforms such as Asana require you to be on an escalated plan type, for instance, Enterprise. Only then can you export your data manually in a JSON format that, though universally friendly, also comes with very specific caveats regarding re-importability. A friendly chart embedded in your guidance, which calls out file type exceptions, can assist with this governance aspect. Now I'll show up a sample on the screen of what that can look like. As I said, this is the most time-consuming and challenging aspect of backup guidance. Having to note how every single platform behaves, especially in a heavy SaaS environment, can be a giant pain in the ass. Still, it is essential that this must be accurate, read, not aspirational, and tested regularly to ensure that accuracy is maintained. Then there's the last two elements, security and encryption, and design. So those are the seven elements of the backup procedure. Now, in terms of physical management for on-premise infrastructure, well, suppose you have a single piece of physical IT infrastructure in a building owned or leased by your company. In this model, you will need to have guidance that details how you will physically maintain that equipment's integrity. I will be covering those specific items in the next section on security, which begs the question, why doesn't guidance for on-premise infrastructure also belong in security governance? Well, it does, and I will get to that later too, but this guidance pertains to the physical protection of equipment from improper access, damage, and loss. 
For instance, what if our physical WAN equipment in the data center exceeds a temperature threshold due to an AC failure? What if the tenant on the floor above has a leak that wipes out several WAPs? What if our primary WAN circuit fails and does not fail over? And so on and so forth. So as with the prior governance constructs, we can cycle back to considering how to address this guidance by asking and addressing a primary question. How can we ensure that adequate physical controls are in place to keep the business running continuously? This type of governance has many approaches. And here I have a footnote. One approach that seems to be gaining in popularity is leasing equipment from a remote management shop that will not only install but remotely manage and heal your hardware. It requires a bit more trust than I'm willing to exercise myself, but you may feel differently, adjust your policy as necessary. You will have to pick the one that most realistically aligns with your expertise, financial bandwidth, and what the environment presents in the way of challenges. For example, number one, do you want there to be an automatic failover redundancy for all key points of infrastructure on site? Well, to do this, you will need to essentially duplicate your environment in a location that's preferably not in the same IDF closet as your primary equipment. If you cannot provide a secondary location within the site and elect to utilize your secondary equipment's primary location, you have only really mitigated a small portion of the risk, and this is the most expensive option. Number two, do we want to create a secondary site for the failover of key points of infrastructure? This viable model was quite popular when VMware and dedoping technology were peaking. In addition to replicating your environment, you would also need to pay a space fee in a co-location facility. Some facilities may let you rent a pre-built secondary environment for less than the cost of your primary environment, but in that case, you should examine whether or not you should simply stick with number one above. This is also very expensive and does not include the cost of traveling to and from that location. Number three, does IT want to equip, empl equip employees with the necessary tethering on their phones and let them work via that method in the event of a failure? It sounds innovative, and it is undoubtedly very low on the cost spectrum, but it gets extraordinarily difficult when taking into account things like VPNs and inadequate wireless coverage in buildings. So this is obviously the lowest cost option, but if you were to tell every employee, go home and use your home Wi-Fi, or just simply turn on your tethering on your phone, you might have a problem. Most likely the answer for right now will most closely align with number one above, though striving for all key points in years one through three may be overreaching a bit. If you have a physical server on site and it is mission critical, determine how the employees who need to access that server will continue to do so from a controls perspective. Tailor your guidance to match the realistic expectations of what you can achieve in terms of providing physical management in the early years. In your guidance, do not ignore acts of God, but do not try to solve them all either. Have in your guidance a plan to routinely test your controls. As you add or change equipment in your environment, continue to keep your physical controls guidance updated and accurately reflective of your world. Now, when it comes to change management, which is our fourth significant aspect of INO governance, the instantiation of change management is key to your IT process. I recommend that you ensure this is done before the end of year one for several reasons, including one, you will be building in the cultural rigor needed to main, manage the more extensive changes coming in year two, as the business will start to make changes to platforms and accounts, which will require change management. Number two, you will have a bona fide period to develop and optimize your change control process before your first audit, unless it's already happened, in which case you would want to do this as soon as possible. And number three, you will have already started to make important changes for which there is likely to be little or no documentation. While this was convenient for you to move very quickly in year one, and react to the business's needs, it can no longer be considered an acceptable activity and norm. As a governance mechanism, change control is a good business practice for regulating all things that change. Realistically, that would essentially grind a company to a halt if it was done across the board. IT need not be the only functional area in the business that considers this tool, though it is often the only place where you will find change control outside of the quality function. Additionally, the maturity and scope of change control will vary from company to company. Just like you need to have an ideal model in mind for your security stack, as covered earlier in the book, you will also want to have a preferred model in mind for the governance of change control long before you step into the batter's box. If no two companies' change control structures are the same, what then should be included in the scope of a change control policy? 
Ultimately, any technology, service, or platform used by the company to perform business functions falls within the scope of change control guidance. That list includes, at a high level, corporate networks, on-premise hardware, XAAS and physical system password changes, any change of role that will be used to assign an individual employee's access, core business application systems, hosted cloud-based computer systems, on-premise software applications, and cloud-based software applications. From there, you can whittle down or increase the list as much as you feel relevant for how you wish to translate the concepts and actions of change control. Your quality leadership may also have an opinion, especially as it relates to how frequently changes can be made and under what circumstances. All of these ingredients will provide context for the construction of this guidance. As far as what is not in the scope of change control guidance, that list is much shorter. It generally contains areas beyond your control, such as vendor-hosted systems, as well as areas that are within your control, but diminutively unimportant, such as routine changes, simple UI updates, and notification changes. Initially, as it will most likely only be you, or you and your partner, the very model of change control will not yet be as inscrutable as it should be. If there are only two IT people in the department, then one is always the changer and one is always the approver. Sure, you can swap that role back and forth as much as you like, but ultimately, until there's a third or more personnel on staff, you are quite limited in declaring your change management process as genuinely objective. As more IT staff come on board though, you will not only be able to delineate the change control process further, but you can ultimately begin to build a change advisory board or a CAB. The CAB can formally become a governing body for approving changes to mission critical systems. This is a reasonably attainable goal on your march towards compliance, and it is generally only held back due to resource constraints. One of the critical characteristics of good change control governance is your ability to build an emergency change control procedure as a matter of standard business practice without abusing change control sovereignty. All too often, as with many policies, circumvention and straight lines to the result can begin to become the norm, especially when there is a perceived idea that the resolution of a particular issue is absolutely business essential. In order to mitigate this abuse, governance should clearly indicate who can submit emergency change controls and under what circumstances. For instance, suppose that a copy machine becomes uncommunicative within the business and the fix is for someone in IT to implement a new change for DNS. If this were the only copier and the business needed to print a large volume of documents that very day, that would potentially be enough evidence to support an emergency change. However, if there were other copiers around that were still fully functional, an emergency change should not be warranted. An emergency change is a type of change control that reflects your ability to recognize a critical issue and immediately fix it, which is then immediately followed by the emergency change control submission instead of the other way around. The idea behind an emergency change control is that the person responsible for fixing the copier knew that even with a rapid change, it would take too long to fix the copier and still help the business make its deadline. So after repairing the loan copier, our IT responder would have submitted the emergency change control explaining not only what they did to resolve the issue, but why they could not wait for a standard change control to run its course. Now, as your cab matures, the review of emergency change controls will be one of its primary remits. The last important note for change control guidance consideration is that an emergency declaration ensures a business risk and an impact analysis should be done before submitting the change. In most ITSM-based service platforms, the built-in change control process will have a section that requires you to fill out at the least, the following four areas of information. The reason for the change, the impact of doing the change, the rollout plan for the change, and the backout plan for the change. Now using this information and whatever other fields are provided to you or customized by you, you can construct the language in your guidance to match so that any change requester is required to complete those fields and provide specific language in each that will be reviewed before acceptance. For example, if we use our copier scenario above, Without the emergency change, we would expect to see those fields completed with similar information to this. Reason for the change? Copier XYZ on the third floor has stopped communicating. Impact of doing the change? Copier XYZ will be out of service for 30 minutes. The rollout plan for the change? I will log in and make the changes. Backout plan for the change? 
If the issues are created for any reason by what I did, I will undo them. Now, you would provide more detail than that. I'm just giving you a high-level sense of what I would say. Now, the next approver in the change control will, will quickly review the summary, ask any additional follow-up questions, and then send it back as an approved change control. This is then followed by the actual change, resulting in a pass-fail type response in the change control workflow. If it is a pass, the change control is updated as such and then closed. If the remedy is a failure, your change control guidance will want to include language about remediation and intentional additional attempts at changes. This is important to note. Let's suppose that what was supposed to be a routine change, as stated above, was the wrong change and did not work as expected, though the assessment about DNS was correct. Your guidance would stipulate that either another new change control will be added with the updated language, or the prior change control would be reopened and the amended changes added. In either scenario, we arrive back at the start for submission and approval. Change control will save your bacon many times over the months and years ahead. When a year or so has passed and you are wondering why a specific platform or piece of hardware is behaving a certain way, you will be able to rely on your change control process and change database to reflect on what was done at that time. When the SOX auditors show up and wish to know who approved that ERP database update from version 11 to version 12, you will have all the information needed to demonstrate how this was performed and why. Now our final area of INO governance, which is IT services, has to do with supporting the business. We went into a substantial deal of information regarding services and support back in Chapter 11. Still, it is worth taking a brief look at one specific IT services area and support area directly related to governance. This type of governance has many names, but it is most commonly referred to as the Service Level Agreement, or SLA. Now, the SLA doesn't just address the how of your support methodology, it also addresses the when. If you recall, I strongly urge you not to utilize any urgency or priority ratings for your service incidents. Your SLA will describe in detail how you will address all of the possible types of issues in the business and within what reasonable maximum time frame. Ostensibly, the SLA is your implicit commitment to the company to always do your best to provide a specific level of service to consistently meet or exceed the standards you established. It will describe what your typical offers hours are, expected response times, what the procedures are for getting assistance, and who is on staff at what times, in addition to all the other relevant information needed to govern your services environment. Now, I will show a sample of an SLA structure on the screen, but you'll be better off looking at this in the footnotes included in the, um, the podcast notes. I won't read the entire table, but just note that basically for every type of potential incident, we talk about an issue and maximum time to resolve, including some higher level categories. Now, creating the SLA is one half of the process. To fully function vis-a-vis -vis using the SLA as your governance framework, you need, to, you need to support your service and support metrics against the terms you established in the SLA. A primary metric for you is whether or not you are adhering to your own SLA. If you are routinely missing your SLA guidelines, either your SLA needs to be amended to reflect better the availability of resources in the business, or you potentially have far more severe problems with your staff and your technology. Your SLA should be made publicly available, as should all IT governance, and combined with your monthly IT service metrics so that your end users can see whether or not you are upholding your standards. Creating and adhering to an SLA is the baseline for IT services governance, and it must be done within your first year of operations. Now, in our last area of governance, security, risk, and compliance. We'll be talking about several of the aspects related to these items. Up to this point, the primary emphasis on security has been on the initial tactical implementation of a security stack that protects the company's assets. We covered this in detail um, back in Chapter 2 and in Chapter 10. In Year 1, much of what you will do from a tactical perspective will represent your overall security program's foundational technology, technology layer. Therefore, we now turn to the governance aspect and shine the spotlight of the how on your security stack. By addressing security, we must also begin to address the concept of risk management as it directly is correlative. 
Ultimately, how much security is needed to align with the business acceptable risk threshold? Furthermore, when we consider both security and risk, we will inevitably arrive at a point whereby we need to address the scope of compliance. Consider, for a moment, that almost all the statutory guidelines relevant to the life sciences industry, to which the company must adhere, have a substantial emphasis on data control. You can't control data without logical security, and you can't discuss logical security without discussing the associated and allowable risk. Much of the guidance related to security will come in the form of documentation, read policy. Though some will come in the form of adherence, read process, to statutory guidance. For instance, you may decide to write a standalone security policy called GDPR policy and detail within it all the actions you intend to utilize to show how you will satisfy the requirements of GDPR. Alternatively, you may decide to design an automated workflow that ensures data is classified appropriately and base that workflow on individual policies that guide the unique aspects of GDPR, for instance, data classification policy, data portability policy, etc. Neither model is incorrect. By using individual policies specifically designed to defend the integrity of process, you allow your future self to be able to refer to those documents over and over again with regards to other related statutory controls, such as CCPA and its kin. Now, as we begin to discuss these various domains of security, risk, and compliance governance, I'm going to uh, put a link in the podcast notes, which shows a very large table where I cover this in detail. But basically, this looks at the most common aspects that will fall into the scope of that model. I'm not going to show the table on the screen because it's quite large. I'm going to skip right over that. But again, please refer to that in the podcast notes. So what will you realistically need for year one? Incorporating the information in the chart above and applying it to the assumed course of operations at your new company, at a minimum, you will want to have policies and process in place for the following. So for policies, you'll want to have access control, endpoint management, anti-malware, a written information security policy, also known as a WISP, acceptable use policy, also known as an AUP, information transfer policy, but only if GDPR or some statutory compliance from a state level applies, data retention and destruction, incident management, new hire and termination, also known as employee lifecycle, and network security. Under processes, you'll want to have onboarding and offboarding employees or employee lifecycle management, you want to have deploying new equipment and managing lost, stolen, or damaged equipment, also known as asset management. You want to have responding to a breach, employee testing against policies and procedures, access request changes, and data classification and portability. Instituting these policies and processes does not mean that you may not need additional governance in place in year one. If your company is much further down the road with certain aspects of growth, you will undoubtedly require further guidance to compensate. Likewise, once these policies and procedures are in place, your work is still not done. These policies and procedures will mature and change as the business grows. New policies and procedures will also be introduced to complement existing guidance or reflect updated business changes. And what does that maturity look like? Well, if we look through our futuristic telescope, we can see that within a few years' time, our security governance model is expansive, and I'm going to show a graphic on the screen. And by the way, I have a note here. Full credit for this graphic goes to Steve Simmons. Uh, if you recall, he was a co guest co-host on episode two of the podcast. Um, Steve is the vice president of IT at Nimbus Therapeutics presently. But he's been a um, CISO for many, many years. A uh, brilliant security um, analyst. So... Uh, again, even for the audio version of this podcast, there's no way to sort of accurately read this graphic. So I'll put a link to it in the podcast notes. But you can see here just how much uh, security guidance and governance comes into play um, over the next few years. So one last note on this aspect of governance. In the life sciences industry, compliance is everything. And as much as you think that you are a technologist first and foremost, you are a compliance specialist above all. It doesn't matter how many security certifications you have, but just try to do anything in IT that doesn't have a compliance dependency. You start with GXP, and while that slowly envelops you, throw in six months of SOX testing every year, 
add in state level guidance like CCPA, Sunshine Law, and global compliance like GDPR. And before you know it, compliance becomes the very air that you breathe. Take heart, however, this is a good thing. You will come to view the world from the perspective of risk. In doing so, you will habitually consider how your policies and your processes impact the business. Good governance for security risk and compliance considers a global approach to a global question. At the end of the day, how can you ensure that your data is both good and safe? All right, we're almost at the end now. Hang in there. So now we're on to data management, and this is sort of the, the big final piece of governance. So with data management, we see a lot of the same themes emerge over and over again throughout all of our other compliance and guidance and governance controls. But specifically, I want to focus on four aspects of good data management. Classification, growth, search, and control. And to some degree, all of these will become at least a discussion point, if not an area demanding action, in year one. And no matter what you do, the company will create and ingest data at an ever-increasing rate. That's just a fact. It will never go in a decreasing direction. If you are interested in understanding how your data grows, you'll want to track several key characteristics that would allow you to gain insights into your data spectrum over a large span of time. Such a scope would include data ranging from emails received per day to new files created per month to space used in AWS by quarter and so on. In your case, you haven't been at the company long enough to complete this exercise. So we'll just step back a moment and assume there is a current natural rate of data growth over the long term. Now, let's we'll also agree on the veritable nature of the axiom that data will always grow. In that case, we will also reasonably infer that the relationships between the data will become more complex as it grows. Furthermore, as the business matures, the content of the data itself will become more complex. Where once you mostly had PowerPoint and Word files in your servers, you'll now have gigabytes of biostats data, chromatographic data, and everything else under the sun. So, data will always grow, and data will always grow more complex. Now, while it is relatively straightforward to measure data growth rate, it is nearly impossible to accurately measure the rate of change in complexity over a specific period. As data is created, it needs to be stored somewhere. That somewhere has particular characteristics that will differentiate it from another somewhere. The number of possible somewheres continues to grow because the somewhere in and of itself is also data. Those characteristics include folder name, folder location, file name, file type, file content, file author, file owner, file size, cloud requirements, and so on. What do these all amount in the aggregate? The classification of data and metadata. And metadata is data. Now, we've evaluated data in several other governance areas, yet there remains one constant that is necessary for any of those other areas of governance to be realistically applicable. They are all aspirationally unattainable unless you can identify your data. In the case of security governance, you simply can't have a realistic access control policy for your data unless you know who needs to access the data, which means you need to know what the data is and where it lives. In the early days at your new company, you will most likely uncover one of the most common data classification structures out there today, the ubiquitous departmental folder structure. Of course, it is the most logical starting point for a corporate layman's data structure. Every department gets their shared drive, and they each create some type of unique folder structure that makes sense to them, then they store their data in that structure, and yada, 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 etc., etc. Now, it should be noted that the structure is not flawed in a basic sense of operations. Yes, you have a finance department, and yes, they need a place to put the files used by their department. This, so far, makes complete logical sense. There is now a finance department folder in our shared drives, and everything is humming along nicely. If someone comes up to you and says, hey, where's all the finance files? You just point over there and say, in the finance server. It's the very next stage of growth, however, where the complexity immediately escalates. You see, one day, the finance department decides they need to work on a slide deck with human resources. Well, let's see now. If they put it in the finance department folder, they can still share it with HR, and from a data perspective, it's technically still owned by finance. Okay, so not, not too bad. Finance still has control and ownership, 
but they started to lose a little bit of control here. See, HR can now download the deck and put its version in some other location, even while still being worked on and versioned in the finance location. So anyway, after a few turns of this collaboration, both finance and HR realize, oh, now we need to have legal provide some perspective on this deck. Oh, so now what do we do? Well, one of them, HR, legal, or finance, will probably take one of three obvious approaches. One, leave in the finance folder and invite legal to it. This is recommended. It's a tactically sound and reasonable collaborative approach, but did they remember to disable the download capability for legal? Let's hope so. Option two, take the file out of the folder, email as an attachment to legal and CCHR to produce an email thread with multiple emails and attachments. This should be avoided at all costs. It's essentially a time bomb. Be sure that both legal and HR will be saving some of the attachments, not all, mind you, in their respective department folders, on their desktops, in their email, or who knows where. Option three, create a new folder called Finance, HR, and Legal, in which this document and other future similar documents will be placed. This kind of fits in the middle. It's not recommended, and maybe it doesn't have to be avoided, but it's not bad for an immediate term solution, but long-term pitfalls are absolutely going to happen. The model breaks down at the precise moment the collaborators realize they must also invite corporate communications to their deck. Now, what do we do? Plus, someone still needs to own the deck. The third approach is not as incendiary as the second option, but get this methodology close enough to, to a lit match, and it falls apart very fast. Now, let's take this to one more level, and then I promise I'll stop this pain. This new deck, which all of these groups I've collaborated on, let's just say now it's done, right? Version 1.0. Thankfully, our trusty finance department disabled anyone else from being able to download the document. So all collaboration was done from the finance drive. Um, obviously, thanks in part to your extraordinary IT leadership and guidance. Now the finance department needs to share this deck with external investors. Well, we knew that sooner or later, more than one version of this deck would have to exist. They now need to make a copy of it available in your third-party virtual data room with the likelihood that the future updates to the deck will be made in a separate editing tree from the first editing tree. Our original little deck grew from a well-controlled little seedling into a multi-dimensional briar patch. This tale of complexity growth is one you'll experience thousands of times, and the above example rep represents a prevalent scenario. For this reason, government should start with the classification element. Classification is the antidote to complexity if it is applied very early on in the data growth trajectory. The difficulty of implementing classification is directly proportional to the rate of complexity growth. As data structures become more complex, so too does the ability to classify them until you eventually reach a point where you would literally have to start all over in any attempt to do it right. The good news is that data management and governance, especially as it relates to classification, need not be overly complicated. In fact, for the creation of initial data classification governance, start with basic logic. If the data equals X, then put it here. Otherwise, put it there. Now, X could represent anything from confidential data to raw machine data. The intended result is that you have to have a specific starting point in your classification decision matrix, as boolean and straightforward as it may be. From here, then you will continue to ask this question over and over until you've exhausted all additional classification options. Naturally, several points will arise when your decision-making matrix cannot be Boolean. You will soon need, to, soon need to add in a third variable, or a fourth, and so on. Your X's will multiply, and so will your Y's, and your Z's, and so on. Your classification structure could include phenotypic aspects, such as department versus project, confidential versus non-confidential, draft versus final, and so on. Where you wish to start this is up to you. I recommend, however, that you start with what you have, or at the very least, what your experience has taught you that works best. If you walk into a company and they are already using or attempting to use a department-based classification model, see if you can make that work further for now. It may save you some time in the long run, though not forever. It may also end up being that you continue to use a department model, but you also add other complementary models around it. There's no one-size-fits-all solution here. Additionally, as you consider other possible data management classification structures, you will want to keep in mind the other aspects of your governance, growth, search, and control. Now, 
in terms of growth, over the years, whenever I've sat down with departments and project teams to discuss how they think they should build their ideal data structures, the one question that I drill down on relentlessly is, does your model scale? I am intentionally trying to dissect their proposed data structure to ensure that it can handle any growth. For instance, if the head of the department leaves the company, will the model break? If their department brings on three new hires next year, will this model still work? If the company brings on another asset or decides to start a new clinical program, will the model flex enough to allow for this? The question is no longer one of the actual total size of your data. The industry has seen fit to it that you can almost infinitely scale these days in terms of gigabytes and terabytes. No, this line of questioning is designed to prevent the one scenario where the only response to here or there is neither. It may take a while to arrive at the point whereby you can be reasonably sure the model is built to be truly scalable. Now, considerations of growth and scalability are only half of the equation, but they are an essential part of the discussion. By constructing a scalable model, you have also created a model that allows for ease of data location, aka search. So growth and search go hand in hand in your guidance. The entire ontological discussion requires that you also consider how someone will find something, not only today, but in the future, not just by, not just by location, but by name and data. Again, reflecting on the scenarios where I have sat down with departments to consider growth, I have also pressure tested their scenarios to consider how anyone will find anything. One question that is useful in this area is, if a new hire walked into your department tomorrow, would they be easily able to find what they need on their own right away? Now, if you think about this for a moment, consider what happens when you started at a new company. How easy was it for you to find anything? Did you have to ask around a lot for this or that document? Did people point you to directories that were not in any classification alignment with the actual content? Oh, no, no, the company org chart isn't in the HR directory, it's in the corporate communications directory under HR public documents. Going back to our scalability questions, our guidance also needs to consider how anyone will locate anything. So remember when we covered backup governance earlier, like an hour ago? That backup governance is directly dependent on this as well. Suppose your growth model is scalable enough and data searchability is facile enough. In that case, your data backup should also reflect these elements, thus making it easy to retrieve data from the past. But let's back up a bit. A moment ago, I advised you to consider how someone will find something and not only today, but in the future, and not just by the location, but also by the name and data. Now, naming conventions are an important component of data management not to be forgotten. Corporations struggle mightily with the idea of comprehensive enterprise-wide naming conventions, and I've never seen or heard of a company that got this universally correct despite best efforts, even with adoptions of FAIR standards. Even if you manage to construct a global naming convention for the company, you are still facing an immense, almost Sisyphean effort in two areas. One, there's a treasure trove of data that existed before you got there, which is incorrectly named. And two, you have to train every new employee to not only adopt your new mechanism for naming, but also to ignore anything they've ever learned in the past. What can you do? My first response is, don't throw in the towel. In your guidance, you can provide a document naming convention within the company, and you can provide reasonable guidance that can be followed. Will it work 100% of the time? No. Can you automate some of it? Most likely, but that will depend on the platforms you use and the amount of effort you put into the automated uh, naming schemas. My second response is, work on this the same way you worked on your growth structures. Don't try to boil the ocean. Start simple and go from there. Some areas of the business will have an easier time adopting this concept than others. Take it one area at a time. You will eventually find some common allies across the business. For instance, no one should use spaces anymore in their file names, underscores only, and unique naming conventions specific to groups. Let's look at two examples of unique naming conventions that share a common corporate characteristic. First, we'll start with a sample guidance for a naming convention for a research team. File names should reflect the contents of the file. File names should contain information such as project acronym or study title. Start file names with the most general component and progress down to the more specific qualifiers. And file names should never use spaces. Be descriptive, not rely on nesting in folders, etc. Now here's a sample of guidance for a naming convention for your legal, legal team. File names should reflect the contents of the file and include enough information to identify the data file uniquely. File names could include information like document type, other company, 
state or country. Start names with the most general component and then progress down to the more specific qualifiers. And don't use spaces again. As far as historical data is concerned, you can spend the time, if you have it, which you don't, to go back and clean up data to match your new file naming conventions. You will most likely migrate some, if not all, of that historical data into your new scalable structures anyway, so it's worth considering despite the effort. Regardless of the historical data and its naming structures, it does possess one immutable characteristic which is useful for you when it comes to future searching. It has a date. In fact, it has at least two dates attributed to it, the creation date and the last modification date. There may not be much to go on, but they will undoubtedly help when it comes time to find data further down the road. I want to briefly touch on metadata again, I just mentioned a few moments ago, but before we dive into our guidance controls aspect, it's worth, it's worth mentioning. There's no way to put this gently, so I'm just going to call as I see it. Metadata adherence sucks. It is very hard to get people to adhere to a metadata standard. I mean, unless you automate it, of course. I mean this in every possible way. The process of entering metadata sucks for all applications, and modern-day tools for searching on metadata also pretty much suck. A lot of suck going on. These lead to folks throwing the towel when asked to employ metadata in all of the work they do. Certain groups in your company love metadata, or like to think they love metadata, and will either attempt to enforce the use of metadata through templates or enterprise platform validation or sheer brute force, but are more of the exception than the rule. If getting any naming conventions established across the company could be viewed as the holy grail of classification, e.g. the FAIR standard, then getting your company to routinely use metadata would be seen as a sacred keg. Now, I'm not saying that metadata is not useful. It is absolutely useful, and I personally love metadata. It is glorious when you can effortlessly search on metadata to zero right in on what you're looking for. The larger enterprise sharing platforms like Google Drive and Box, uh, they have good metadata structures, but it's not on all data content. Do I need to add the word survival to my metadata of this document when Google has already contextualized this entire document and bring it right to my fingers before I even finish typing S-U-R-V? If you would like to include language in your data management governance related to metadata, my only advice is to be realistic. If the enterprise platform you're using in regulatory will not let you submit a document without keying in metadata, awesome, go with that. If your quality management system has four metadata fields that you must fill out before you approve a document, sweet. Ride that one into the sunset. Embrace those few blissful moments of metadata, but as for the rest of the company, be thoughtful about whether or not the enforcement of metadata in your overall governance will help you or just make people wonder about your mental state. Almost done. Hang in there. The final aspect of data management governance and governance in general is an area I've already covered from multiple angles. Control. However, now I'm considering the implications of control policies and processes within the context of data management guidance. This guidance will evaluate control mechanisms from an access perspective who should see what, and a life cycle perspective, how does data live? The former question is addressed to our security governance and managed when considering the here or there concept, while the latter is addressed by creating new data management guidance. Our classification, scalability, and growth are all essentially delimited by the who question. If I am building data structure guidance for a certain department, I am going to ask the following questions at every level of the structure. Who should see this? and what should they be able to do with it? Now, if we use the familiar concept of hierarchical data structures, it is true that regardless of which operating system you use or which data storage platform you rely on, there is a rights-based structure in place. It is strictly a top-down structure for some platforms, meaning that you can move from the least restrictive permissions to the most restrictive permissions as you travel down the hierarchy, but you can override that as you travel down the structure. In other platforms, it may only appear to be hierarchical but it in fact is a flat structure, which means that while it starts at least restrictive at the top and defaults to most restrictive as you navigate down, it is agnostic and you can override and assign privileges in either direction. Some platforms like Box embrace the idea of waterfall permissions, which is actually like our first example, yet does not allow you to override the structure permissions as you travel down. So how do unique data structure controls impact our control guidance? 
Well, for one, it means that your guidance cannot be so specific as to discount the unique nature of the platforms in place within your business. You will either have to create guidance unique to each type of structure or develop single guidance that is broad enough to cover the entirety of the enterprise. There is no right or wrong approach here. If the data in question sits in an ostensibly flat data structure, you will want to focus on control guidance that considers that aspect when discussing those affected groups. Flat structures provide the most options for collaboration, but they can also yield the most complicated structures. Hierarchical top-down structures offer the least amount of collaboration options, but they provide the most straightforward structure designs. Consider all of these aspects when designing your controls as part of your data management go governance. You will have already created a security governance model that ensures least privilege access, so you can now take that approach and apply it to the data storage models you construct. In terms of filling in the gaps related to data management control, we asked how does this data live? This existentially speaking, data is truly binary. One moment it is not there, the next moment it is, a virtue of re reassigning ones and zeros. Where formerly there was a conceivably blank space, it has now been filled with some logical bit of data. How and why did it get there, and now that it is there and has been seemingly classified, how long should it stay there and where should it go next? To answer these questions, we have to go back to the beginning, to our classification structures. Now, I'm going to show a table up on the screen. which basically shows the breakdown of this information. If you are listening on the podcast, unfortunately, you get to miss looking at yet another table, but I recommend you go to the book to read it, and it will be in the notes. <clears throat> Knowing that data can be generated in many ways, we can create a global understanding of our digital assets using a model like the chart above. For instance, if we want to effectively control our Slack data, we want to understand how it comes to exist and understand what our capabilities are for allowing it to continue to exist. Supposing that we continue to fill out this chart, and further down the line we identified platform ABC, which does not allow us to control the life cycle. We would need to make sure we enumerate this in our guidance. In this example, the platform ABC automatically sends SMS notifications to specific phones in the business related to alerts. While you may be able to delete the text from your phone, unlikely, an intermediary outside of your control exists, the phone company, which keeps your text for three years. Therefore, you only have some control over your data's life cycle, but not all the data. Now, depending how, depending how far along the business is in creating a data retention and destruction policy, this would ultimately be a superseding aspect of governance, which will help you frame how you respond to the types of data your business generates. The three most likely scenarios which apply here are, one, there's already a data retention and destruction policy in place. So you can simply lean against that policy to create a data classification, growth, and control structure. Aging and removal of data will be considered when making your classification and growth schema. Two, there is no data and retention and destruction policy, but there is a desire to create one. Three, there is no desire to create a data retention and destruction policy now or at any future point. In this case, it's not entirely safe to just assume that all data will be here forever. You should still include some aspects of control especially regarding personnel data. But by and large, you have to assume that you will keep everything forever. On that note, if you do already have a data retention and destruction policy in place, you will need to build the controls into your governance that allow you to both detect and automatically age out data that meets or exceeds the thresholds in your policy. This is easier in some places than others, but the burden falls on you to make sure this happens, at least from a technological perspective. Simply stated, the better your data management governance is, the easier it will be for the business to a. Adhere to policies such as data retention and destruction. B. Conform to statutory compliance concerns. C. Scale up and be unrestrained by data inhibitors. And 4. Utilize the best data at the right times. When I started this chapter on governance, like years ago, I emphasized that IT governance is just one part of the overall organizational governance structure. It is essential that, even in the absence of other governance, the IT leader sets an example for how good business practices can and should exist. This means that you and your department must carry the torch and effectively create the model for the rest of the company to emulate. This transcends merely eating your own dog food, and as the saying goes, this is bigger than that. This is you, the IT leader, incorporating effective governance into all of the activities you do. This is you, the IT leader, recognizing the difference between realistic and aspirational goals between today's company and tomorrow's company, and between what should and should not happen regarding the entire scope of technology you are obligated to manage. Remember, 
Governance is your how. Make it count. Now, in terms of Chapter 15 summary, key takeaways. You need to begin creating and implementing IT governance in the following areas in year one. Prioritization and project management, development, infrastructure and operations, security, risk, and compliance, and data management. Your goals for year one at a minimum should be to address and culturalize the necessary components of these governance concepts. You will discover early on how much the company can ingest of any of these. Look for other examples of where governance may be growing the business and lend your support to those causes. Likewise, ask those individuals to help you support yours. With that in mind, sometimes IT has to be the first department to introduce the concept of good governance to the business. Do not sit around and wait for someone else to do it first. You don't have the luxury of waiting. Any governance that you construct must be realistic and non-aspirational. You should never write guidance or develop a policy that includes languages for activities you do not do. For instance, if you do not take backups of all systems every Sunday, you would not state that you do that in any documentation. And lastly, governance requires that you consider both the short and long term regarding how you will build it for each of the areas of focus. Short-term governance should not be established just to get short-term wins, but as a foundation for growth that aligns with where the company is headed. Pro tips, avoid aspirational language in your governance. Keep it realistic and align with the expected growth. You will be amending your governance many times over time as the business matures and becomes more complex. There are many third-party tools that will allow you to do a low-level forensic analysis of data to get a better sense of growth over time from a historical perspective. Looking into these options of getting a full grasp of data is of near-term importance to you. When it comes to deploying governance in the business, you have to ensure that IT follows the governance to the letter. Just like I said, it's about eating your own dog food, but more so. This applies tenfold when it comes to getting governance buy-in across the business. Things to watch out for? Well, in the case of life sciences, as sure as the sun sets and rises, people hate policies, rules, and committees. I mean, that goes for any industry. Sadly, there's not much you can do to ease the pain. If you go on this mission alone, you will clearly find resistance to your pedagogy as it will seem to come out of left field. If, on the other hand, you try to enlist every group in the company to help you develop your governance, you will find that it is impossible to deploy because of the myriad of opinions. Find a middle ground get the best partners to join you. I screwed up getting good governance deployed more times than I can remember. And it generally came down to having the wrong people or too many people involved in getting the governance off the ground. It is totally okay to swing and miss so long as you at least try to swing for governance. At one company, I tried to deploy project management and prioritization in the first year and it totally fizzled out. All the key contributors were buried in FDA submissions and no one had the time to do good old-fashioned project management and prioritization. It didn't stop us from trying our best, though, and we did ultimately manage to get the basic building blocks in place. But it wasn't until my third year we were able to get deep traction on governance. From there on, it went quite smoothly. Thanks for listening to that chapter. It was exceptionally long. I'm going to turn it back over to, well, myself and Mike and Nathan Doyle to continue on with the podcast. My mouth is, my throat's a little dry from reading (laughs) for the last 10 minutes in that chapter. That was a short one, actually. Um, No, it wasn't. That chapter was long AF. Long AF. L-A-F. But I said, like I said before, just critical. Governance. uh, Well, I said it in the chapter read. I mean that was its own book before I was like, no, let me just shrink it down slap it into a small little box and make it in 46 pages of, of writing. Um, that's governance. And so many people have written about it. I took my take on it. And I think, um, I don't think I did it justice, but I think what we do is we cover the, the key points. Now you wouldn't run, you wouldn't run a prison without locks and doors Right, so why would you try to run an IT department without processes and principles? I mean, maybe prison's a bad example, but um, you wouldn't try to do something very complicated without having rules. Mm-hmm. Right. And that is essentially the, the, the bare bones of governance. Anything that has strict rules, anything in the manufacturing, walking to a manufacturing floor of a plant, there's a, there's a, there's a method. 
I'm talking Six Sigma methods now, but there's a method, right? That's a process that's governance. So at the top of the show, we, we did discuss decentralization of IT. We're going to come back to that now because I want to talk about that for a bit. And then I want to focus on some questions about this chapter we just read. Now, um, Mike and I, uh, or Mike was talking earlier about sort of his particular vision of decentralized IT. And I want to come back to that for a second, Mike. Now, you sure. mentioned um, there has to be some sort of has to be some sort of centralized something with regards to you can't just have completely and 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 I think the idea we were getting at was maybe decentralized and federated are two different ideas. Sure. Yeah. But in decentralized, the way that I was describing it, there has to be some kind of glue. Yeah. Like if you were to if you were to sort of try to sum up that that glue is, like what what would you say? I think the one thing that comes to mind 100 percent is cybersecurity. Um, in with cybersecurity, there needs to be some guardrails and with some rules, okay. I think. Um, so, I mean, I think that plays into the government's uh, governance, governance discussion as well, is that um, cybersecurity is truly unique to that role. And you know, I think even in some, uh, in many organizations, cybersecurity lives outside of IT. So I think there's this uh, thought process across um, a, a lot of bigger companies, especially software companies, um, that feel that needs to be a separate function, a centralized function. Why does IT, why does cybersecurity report in IT? I think because it went under the technology moniker and it's a, it's a compliance and risk function, right? Um, not that IT isn't, and often is, it has to be to some extent, right? Um, so it fits well there in smaller organizations. But I think now with the SEC leg legislation and, and uh, just cybersecurity so publicly visible in terms of it being a risk, and a huge uh, impact to different businesses in the stock market, and also just in terms of performance and, and overall, um, <laughs> not wanting to have your name on the front page of the paper, uh, is to have rules and constructs that cybersecurity teams uh, are, are respected and able to put certain rules in place. That being said, I think this, this same level of risk uh, reaching out from cybersecurity is true in business process. You know if. If you don't have any business processes, it's pretty easy to get hacked. Yeah. Right. Um, if right. you have business processes and everyone knows what they are, they can raise their hand even if they don't know anything about cybersecurity and say, we're not following our process. Something's not right here. I better tell someone. Yeah. Um, so that's that sort of business process governance comes into play um, where if everyone has their own certain rules of the road, it's hard for cybersecurity to understand what the norms are, what 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 patterns they need to look for that type of thing. So I think it is very important for cybersecurity to be a centralized function. Um, but it doesn't take away the fact that for cybersecurity to be um, successful, there has to be a huge element of distributed awareness across the whole organization and that cybersecurity has to be woven into the culture of any company. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to call it cybersecurity. We can call it risk and other things too. But um, I think it's kind of both in terms of how we get it out there from a compliance perspective. Sorry, it was good. To no, 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 you're, you're, you know, it's inspirational what you're saying in many ways is and it's a sort of stoking thought, right? Yeah. Um, if it's not clear, I'm not used to being on podcasts. Here, <laughs> no, here, no. Here's you, another you moment. Um, no, I, I, I think, you know, so if we're talking about decentralization, right, and we're, we're looking at the ways businesses can decentralize, right, their various functions, but yet improve process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, Mike, your point is very, very uh, astute, right? You know, that could prevent some additional risk as we decentralize, right? What if what if team A and team B look at cyber differently or look at security differently, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and effectively train differently or don't, don't, pick up on typical new trends, right, in the same yep. ways, right? You might have a business unit that's fully exposed as far as a risk and risk. another one fully secured, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think in a decentralized model, to decentralize cyber away from IT, right, your security, I want to use the word security, not just cybersecurity, but security away from IT, yep. is an important uh, an improvement upon our service delivery, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been an overburden or a unicorn sort of viewpoint on IT talent that she or he, they are going to come to the organization and they're going to be able to be fully capable across the broad spectrum mm, of great technology point. management, right? Great point. There are so few unicorns that truly exist and even those that consider themselves unicorns are seen as unicorns in the environments or the, within the industries mm -hmm. that we all serve in, specifically the life science industry, right? Sure. Um, they need help. 
They, yep. they want community help, right? It's one of the things we love about this community. It's a true sense of community. But yep. I think if we're going to really take a decentralized model, you have to look at security as another component of that, right? It yes. needs to be decentralized as well, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and, and it, you're, you're, end of the day, there's rules and yeah. regulations, right? It, it needs to be outside of IT, but I think it needs to be a centralized function. Absolutely. It's, it's just not within IT. So, yeah I, I could, yeah, I agree. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, and it, it, it's it's this is my opinion. Yeah. Very very important. Very very important, right? You know, it's it's the one thing that that keeps me up at night and it's the one thing that will keep you employed, yeah. so to speak, is doing that well, right? Exactly. Uh, you do that poorly and you're very quickly out of a role and take, maybe out of an industry. Take incident response planning, right? That's a huge cross-functional effort. Yes. It's got to be owned really centrally by probably one group, not multiple ones. Um, so yeah, it's 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 cybersecurity scares me to death. I oh. mean, there's so much of this stuff like that's out of our control. Um, I mean, could you imagine the communication? You know, when, when you're implementing an IRP, you're implementing you know these different response mechanisms, right? Mm-hmm. If you have one business unit that's effectively you know uh, escalating and communicating in one method, and another one's using another method, yep. and all of a sudden because method B was used by department B, you're yep. now exposing yourself to litigation or you know potential further harm. Sure, right? That's 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 a risk. So. I just pulled yeah, up this, that's a great point. I pulled up, I Googled the Vice President of Information Technology job description, and I found this one, the first hit. They may also drive the implementation of development best practices through the organization while governing control and ensuring objectives are achieved. Risk management, resource allocation, project prioritization, and research and recommendation of new systems round out the Vice President of IT's typical job duties. Mm-hmm. So why is that? Like, so let's back up a second. Um, <laughs> what if, so you're saying that we take security out of IT, which I totally agree with, by the way, put it in the middle of the organization, let it run and IT would be a customer of it mm-hmm. or, or sort of have a dotted line to it. Totally agree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about, I mean, the chapter we just talked about was about governance and there was a big part of that about project management. Yeah. Sure. But you're both suggesting, and you were saying this earlier, Nathan, that you can take a PMO and put it in an organization. And we'll talk about sort of what kind of person would go in there in just a second. But what this job description is saying, again, this is a random one I just pulled up, is that they want this VP of IT to run project prioritization for the business. So, mm-hmm. and I could probably look up a bunch of these and find the same exact description in many of them because it seems pretty generic. These are very common, yeah. But why do we keep coming back to that point? So, if I have to hire an expert right. in IT. Okay. Okay, I'm a new I'm a new co. Right. Got to go hire my IT leader now. We got to f- file that IND or we got to go ahead and launch this program. I need them to be able to be operationally astute. They need to be able to like do cloud stuff and security. And they need to be able to do he- support and service and be a good business person and also project management. We just basically listed all the jobs that are in IT in mm-hmm. one person. Now <laughs> to, be, to be fair, when we described the IT leader back in episodes one and two, we talked about this exactly thing. This thing. Yeah, yeah. You have to have all those things. Yep. Yeah. But the point is, you have to have them because you yourself are building IT. Yes. Because you've got to bring the right resources. You've got to bring the resources in to then do these things. Mm-hmm. You have to know how they work. You knew what, what good looks like too, right? But to what, some extent. Here's what happens. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Here's what happens is. If you are good at them, well, you end up doing so, them. So, <laughs> so I have a question, Nathan. In terms of the person, yeah, we're talking about. So, in episodes one and two of this podcast, we speculated, and I wrote that for someone to come in and lead IT, they should be well-rounded in all areas of IT. Now, when I said that, I was speaking about, and this is my own classification now because I, I've been led to believe this. Or speaking about, again. Hardware, software, security, service and support. And then there's that sixth element, which is project management. Even I'm putting it into the, into the portfolio. What does that person, what does that mean? It means you're looking for a unicorn. It means you're looking for that mythical creature that can do everything. And we, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some liberty. I think, you know, those that are, you know, participants of this podcast that have read your, your you know, your, the materials that you've published over the years, Nate, 
um, which are awesome, right? I mean, massive help, right, to us in the industry. You can come back anytime. By thank the way, thank you, thank you. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> automatic, uh, <laughs> automatic approval, right there. But the 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 I think the hyper focus on finding that one person that can do it all uh, actually presents a bigger risk to the business, right? One, you're not hiring, you're not bringing in talent soon enough, yep. right? Because you're hyper focused on that talent having to check every single box, right? Yep. In an anecdotal way, I've had colleagues that I believe are much brighter, much smarter than me, right, who have stated that they have gone in for 15, 20, 30 interviews for a head IT role, mm-hmm. right? And these, it doesn't help that the model that we're seeing in our industry, which is supported by the VCs in our industry, yeah. are, again, super focused on this one person can do it all model, right? Yep. And it, it, now, I, I, not to go too wide here, I, I think that's typically just within the GNA functions. If you look at yep. other functions, yep. they don't typically have that level of requirement. And GNA, by the way, general administration. Yeah, so, so mean, your finance, your legal, your IT, yeah, right? HR, um, HR. HR. Sometimes you put an informatics department in there, right? Yep. As well, uh, you know, the more mature companies will put that under R and D, right, for budgeting for purposes sure. and whatnot. But yeah, you know, I think that unicorn piece is hard, right? So, you know. One of the deficits I, I personally had earlier in my career, right, was a lack of project management understanding, right? There were certain terms I didn't understand. I didn't understand the function of it. I ended up having a really good leader help me th- through that, provided me the training, provided me the opportunity, and, and, and got me up to speed. And I have to say that was the one thing that helped me land more roles, become more effective. Mm-hmm. However, I don't think that needs to be the end-all, be-all of what an IT leader has. Or you know, They can bring that in. You can bring that talent in. I so, think that's some of what they might depend upon with some of these roles is that you may have the, the background, but it's even better if you know the vendors. Mm-hmm. If you have a, you know, there's many of them, but like ones that can come in and run IT projects and you're just resourcing and budgeting appropriately, especially in the VC kind of funded stuff, it seems like you know, there's a lot of MSPs that are in there. You can go get a third party for implement an implementer. You get a good bench of, you know, kind of uh, statement of work type projects and that you can not so much manage the nuts and bolts of that, but actually be able to bring that in and have a, do a more portfolio management type model uh, and, and rely on a, a source. You may spend more money, but wow. that might be some of what they're looking for is for you just to make it happen by hiring whoever you need to hire. Not, not FTEs but going out and just renting. So, <laughs> well, I gotta unpack what you just said. I'm saying so, that they, that you can go, that some companies may look for a head of IT to come in and just go rent the labor they need to get okay, things going. Okay, so, yeah. so hold that for a second, because a moment ago you said take cybersecurity out of IT. Again, I agree. Yeah. It's own function. I'm what talking you, about the job description you just read, and you asked why. I know. Yeah. 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 But yeah. so, but you're and you're you're saying that you're, the unicorn role, right? Which we all know, like for startup companies, especially for new co's, yeah. you need an IT leader who does come with all all the tools, right? Yeah. That's the best thing you can possibly invest in. But now, you maybe think about another thing, which is, <laughs> what if you take take governance out of IT, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. make it its own function. Yep. So now you have IT does not have governance, it does not have cybersecurity, and their IT leader can come in and work with those people, work with that leader of governance, work with that leader of security at, in their first 90 days, first year, yeah. and say, okay, so what's the cybersecurity plan? Oh, this is your standards? Cool. Like here, I'll go ahead and build my foundational plan. Oh, yep. this is how I do processes? Cool. Like This is how I'll do my stuff. Yep. How much more velocity can they get? Like How much more could that IT leader do? If they're focused on everything else but cybersecurity, well, not they're not fo- not not focused on it, but mm-hmm. it's sort of like peripheral. Like, okay, I got yeah, the yeah. standards, but I'm going to do everything else. How much more velocity can this person get? Well, I mean, you're giving somebody some foundation, right? right? So instead of telling them, "Hey, there's you know, there's the driveway, there's all the supplies, go build the house," <laughs> right? You're actually providing them at least you know some base to build off of, right? And you know, how many of us have gone to those organ, you know, those places where we were promised? Yep. A driveway full of materials, and there was nothing there. Not even a driveway, right? And how many times you've walked in and were like, "Well, yeah. there's a little bit of something. Okay, I can work with this, right? Yeah. I, I can actually get more done than what you're suggesting in your book in year one because there was a foundation there, right? Maybe there's a a program management team. Maybe there's other teams that have, you know, maybe yeah. a PM function already there. Um, wow. So, so, so we. So go I was going to say, sounds like the 
one of the things that could be really effective is if very early on in some of these businesses, especially if, we're, if it's more of a you know, distributed functions around risk and compliance and, and cybersecurity, which uh, I think a lot of cyber orgs, they're taking GRC completely. So they're, they're actually, even some GXP stuff is coming to cybersecurity, yeah. on the life science. So it's, you're seeing this sort of function get built. Um, but what I was going to say is I think that, uh, you know, you have people come in, you said you have a great foundation, having those in place. Is for, for a company, and this seems everywhere I think I've been, I don't know, a few of them that I've been have done this more so once they have a product in the market, but it's to have an operational model. Yeah. Right. And if they start really early on, maybe it's hard to tell because you're not sure what your product roadmap is going to look like and whatnot. But that can help foster kind of a any any distributed model, not just in IT, but in finance and other places. But it's about how does a company want to operate? How does it? And it's not just an IT or you know CIO decision. It's it's a it's a fundamental executive team uh, COO decision if they have one. And I think that's what can really it can really foster and feed though the idea of decentralized models across the business. So you're basically small teams. You're basically going to put Gartner out of business, by the way, if you keep going, <laughs> because because now what you're supposing. I'm just I'm just at a different approach to starting a business more no, than anything else. I mean, I get you. Like, I'm a, believe me, I'm on board. Dude. I'm subscribed <laughs> to your magazine. Like, I love all the issues. <laughs> um, all okay, my logos I'm, and my diagrams. I have them all saved in my library. <laughs> Think about this idea, okay? <laughs> I'm just gonna throw this, like, don't think about this idea. That, that, Mind blown. That before, like, so IT is gonna get hired someday for this for this new co. So before they even hired IT, they hired the security person to come in and start building security. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with a company right now, um, and I'm helping them sort of begin to define, they, they, they need a head of IT. Mm -hmm. They've come to me to help them find one. And I'm working to help them find it. And of course, in the job description is, you know, build a cybersecurity plan. Uh, I simply suggested, well, what if you, we, we went out and found a cybersecurity person for you and we focus on the IT role? Well, no, no, it's got to be inside the cybersecurity role. Like, it's, I mean, the IT role, it's all going to be one together. Like, well, what if you just kind of took it out? Like, I know an MSSP we can use, they can get you going. Let IT just focus on, no, 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 I want it all together. So, I mean, I'm getting paid to give my best opinion. I give it, <laughs> but then you have to sort of relent. You know the drill. Uh, yep. Yes, yes. Um, so, where was it going with this? So what if, in the scenario, that person already existed, mm -hmm. and then, again, we're still pretending, so let's pretend again that also there's a strong program manager in that company, and they have an idea for program management. And so the IT leader comes in and says, oh, you have cybersecurity, you have program management, and again, we're pretending. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say two things one and you if you did that every single thing that every single conference vendor that's ever been invented up until now has they have to stop presenting because all their conferences are bullshit so every security conference everything like that they all just dissolve because they mm -hmm. don't work anymore yeah you've just you've disrupted the whole industry in one one fell swoop success but that's the one thing <laughs> and and just give me one second and i'll say the second thing the second thing mm -hmm. is what if you did one more what if you took one more group out what if you took out the um, employee experience part of IT and put that in its own group? Now, hold on, and I'll explain in a second. So decentralized IT, what you're doing is you're bringing people to do process and governance. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a distributed function, like you're putting process and governance in the business, but you take out, uh, or so you're bringing IT rather, sorry, I screwed that up. You're bringing in IT to go ahead and build that IT. You build out operational structures, make the business run, blinky lights are on and all that stuff. Yep. You've taken out cybersecurity, put them over here. You've said, okay, well, we need process and all these other things in place. So someone's actually running that too as a PMO. Then you'd say, okay, well, we want employees to have the most, the, the, like the best possible experience pos uh, mm -hmm. that they can. So from the moment that they're hired to the moment that they leave, the whole thing is governed by a group. Like they're running this employee experience. Yeah. So IT is still left with the lion's share of operational work. They still have to make sure that all the things work, they have to make sure that all the software and systems and all the things are communicating. They still have a huge burden. They're not getting off easy. But what they've done is they said, cybersecurity, you're over there. Program management and governance, you're over here. And then employee experience, like you're the glue that holds us all together, but you're over there. You tell us what the employees are feeling, how they're thinking, what they need, like what's coming next. Take that out too. Mm -hmm. And what are you left with? You're still left, like I said, with a huge IT burden. You need a strong IT leader. Yep. 
but now all of a sudden you've changed the model. Yep. Uh, I know that's not what the chapter was about, but I just wanted to talk about this for no, one this second. No, this is great. So what are your thoughts on that idea? Am I completely batshit crazy? Or no, I, this works. No, or do you take, no, you take, no. You take all three out. I think, so what is, is there anything left in IT at this point? Just IT operations? Operations. Okay, that's it. Yeah, I think that, that works. Which, and employee experience Think about it. You need data retention and destruction policies. You need backup plans. Mm -hmm. You need everything that's got to work. There's got to be redundancies. i got to be able to log in. Right? Now, cybersecurity is saying, well, here's your access controls, but I still need an account. Yep. I still need to be able to get email. So largely, it's almost going back to what traditional IT is, right? It's kind of going back to having, um, you know, if you unless employee experience includes kind of the, the front end customer service so help desk type model, I, that could potentially be part of employee experience, right? Because uh, the touching, the feeling, being able to see and know everyone in the company. What's Gen AI doing for that? Mm. Yeah. Well, okay, forget that. That was a big one. So. Yeah. So I'm just saying, where would that does that go in IT ops? Because I would say that really uh, the ops piece, just like, infrastructure, tradition, almost traditional IT well, stuff, servers, laptops, you know, that type of thing. Let's say experience is, uh, let's say the IT side is, okay, build 100 laptops, we have 100 new employees. Mm -hmm. That's IT's remit. Yep. Experience is, hey, welcome to Nuco. Here's your laptop. I'm going to help you set it up, and you're going to go about and do your job with your functional Agreed. line. Yep. IT is like this other thing that did that. Then they're like, oh, I have a problem with my laptop. Okay, go in this portal, type in your thing. You're talking to a human being who's, yep. or a bot, yep. who's mm -hmm. going to help you solve the problem. If you can't, it then goes into IT. But IT is solving the technical problem and kicking it back to the employee experience person yes. who is then handling that mm -hmm. from there on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, works totally. And so IT ops would also handle integrations and automation? All that. Okay, you wouldn't put uh, automation in the employee experience side. It's still too technical. Put it in the back end ops. Yeah. Group. So, uh, so what happens is employee experience says, "Hey, listen, we uh, we've noticed that we can shave six minutes off of the orientation if we do this automation here. Can yep. you do that for us." To your point, it goes into an agile workflow. It's a two week sprint comes back out. Yeah. Employee experience changes. They're now a better group because of it. But they used IT as their partner to do employee experience. It's it. not in IT. Got it. I think that works. Too radical? No, no. I think it's just it's separate functions. Who do they all report into? Do the five heads of those groups report into the CFO or the CEO? Or Employee experience reports into digital experience lead or yeah. uh, some digital concierge or... The, that's the only downside I see of it is the direct report discussion. Like, does a CFO want six direct reports or the CEO? Or is there... Are they going to program yeah, management? Yeah, it's yeah. what's the top level look like, where you can make the case. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of this. This sounds amazing. I'm just thinking about how the prospect of you've got now you've got kind of this committee and maybe that's it, making it more of a small teams model that that has a community based decision making process, where they just report back to the ELT, you okay, know, like okay. or the executive team, right? Well, <laughs> which, a, so which, I'm only going to pause you right here, Mike, because. I'm going to answer that question, and this is like kind of like a little, this is like a little, it's like a cliffhanger for next week. Yes. We're going to answer that question next week. Oh, good. Love that. So next week, keep, keep us on the edge of our seats. Because we're talking about governance, and Nate completely derailed, Nate, not Nathan, derailed this whole fucking thing <laughs> by taking Mike down this journey. I love it. I'm but loving this. This before, is a good discussion. Before, before we do that. Do you have a brief answer for that? Or do you want to come back next week and also talk about that? I'll come back. Okay. So I love that. Right. Yeah. Next week, we're going we're gonna to answer that question. Yeah. Don't you worry. So we're going to so employee experience. I love it. In IT or outside of IT, and how does it work with IT and this new decentralized nirvana nexus of Neverland that we've <laughs> developed. Nexus of Neverland. I love it. That we've developed here on... The cognitive load. The islands of invention. But sadly, we have to get back to governance. Man, that was boom, fun. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> so. I got to find that one. All right. Okay, I just brought it way down there. Uh, some all reputations. So I did write down some softball questions for you. I feel like I should have index cards. Like... Okay, so, hey, how was the pizza the other night? Uh, 
so I'm gonna just gonna read a couple of these. You guys probably already saw them if you cheated, but mm. and now you have to answer. So, let's think about year one. I mean, the chapter was on year one. Yeah. It did cover some basic elements of years two and three in your new IT role, but in terms of year one, you have 12 months. And regardless of what time of the year you start, although it can have a major impact on what you do for governance, what do you do in your first year? I think it's very dependent upon what you're what you're coming into, right? You're, um, you're sort of, you know, Two, two, two areas. So, so, so it's like, let's pick three, three areas. Okay. Complete shit show. Yep. Things seem to be okay. All right. And they've already got a project manager in place. Ah, okay. Um, you know, it, it, one and two, it, it, I think you're, you, you could be more successful as a seasoned IT leader, you know, sort of wearing that unicorn hat. And, you know, just to be clear, I do think unicorns exist. Yep. I just think they're very hard to find. Hard to find. You know, yep. they're very hard to find. They're hard to identify. Mm -hmm. um, you can put, you know, those things on paper of what they should, you know, have experience wise. Um, but it's hard to quantify that and qualify that when the hiring team itself doesn't have that experience. The, that's another topic, though. Um, I think what if it's a complete S show, right? You're looking at a total shit show in first year, mm -hmm. right? What you're looking to do is you're trying to impact the culture in the most positive way in that first year, which is, you know, you want to in right size the governance or policy, right? Red tape, whatever yep. you want to call it, right? To what you see. So go down one level. Okay. So I'm in my first year. All right. I'm say let's say I'm seven months in. Yep. And it's a shit show. Right. What would I have done? Like, what would I ideally have done? Would have I would have first you know outside of the initial fact gathering right yeah. that first ninety day fact gathering that you're doing your interviews mm -hmm. right all the prep work you do leading up to the job right Nate that you so eloquently sort of you know call out in the book um, you know I think in that seven month mark right what I would be hoping to sit back you know over a glass of whiskey at home saying to myself man look at me I did it right is that I got buy in I got collective buy in okay. and I have. I have established the idea or the concept of a steering committee in some format and or I have at least regular check-ins that focus not only on what their needs are but where they're headed. What's your steering committee do? Well, you know, in a complete shit show, it might just be to have a beer on a Friday. Like, seriously, just try to drive culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, honest to goodness, you know, making friends in a complete shit show is probably one of your best, you know, strategies, right? Make friends, right, across across the spectrum yeah, of that business. Yeah, storm, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, if they're going to be hiring too, let's say it's a complete shit show and it's an early stage company and they're going to bring on 10, 10 new people, mm -hmm. do your darndest to be on that hiring committee, you know? Help yeah. help affect change. Be involved. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, first build, year. Build that credibility, right? That's That's credibility. huge. And, uh, you know, some, some of it could be quick wins, too, if you can find, quick based wins. on the fact finding. That. Quick wins are big. Quick wins. Um, sh shit show or, or not shit show, uh, determining and documenting IT standards are huge. Yeah. Making sure that you know what people are using. Even in a well-oiled machinery uh, company, I think uh, often there's a lot of, they brought you in for a reason, and a lot of times it's to really set the course going forward. Most of the time, that's identifying and starting to build. You can't some set a standards. course if you don't have a map, right? That's so right. if you're not documenting, you're yep. not consistently documenting, yep. right? You're only screwing future you, right? Yep. You're only hurting future you and the future people you bring in. So in scenario mm -hmm. three, where there's already an experienced program lead or project lead in place, mm -hmm. is your remit to get on board with everything that they've done and accept it? I, it? No, I think you should be allowed to challenge it. I mean, it's just specifically, I mean. Especially if it's taking a long time to get things done. It, like you said, it depends on the situation you yeah. walk into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you may be able to lend some, some ways to make things move faster or even take more risk in some scenarios. Yeah. Uh, some people have been in the industry 30 years plus have come in, they get a very set way to do it, and it might take way longer than it needs to take. And build that friendship, build yep. the connection, build trust, so that when you walk in and you say, hey, we could kind of change this a little bit, you're already a couple beers in, and you're and you might actually come out with some output there, some results. You know, I think one of the things <laughs> that gets a lot of people in trouble is the human element, right? Your ego gets in the way, and yeah, so you yeah. walk into these 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 roles, these situations with people, and you you know you have this inner the inner id sort of wanting to say, oh, make yourself known, make your presence you know felt, 
right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, my gentle recommendation here is don't do that. Mm-hmm. You have plenty of time to do that later on when when you really need something, right? Spend those spend that first seven months, right, in that phase three, right? That you know, there's a program manager yeah. align with align with them. Ask yeah. them what have they done? How did they get success? You know, what have they found to be challenging? Great point. That's a point. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> in all my years, I've only ever walked into a situation where they're with with a company where they're which happened one time where there was somebody who was, I would consider an experienced program lead. And this person was very open to not only sort of my way of thinking, because we met pretty early on. Do you want some more ice? Ah, I'm good, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. This person was uh, very open to it, but also was like, you know what, honestly, I, I've been doing this for so long and I've only done it one way. Can you perhaps help me out? Now, mm-hmm. I... I actually told this person said, actually, the way you're doing it is pretty awesome. <laughs> Let's so do it. <laughs> we ended up we ended up creating this sort of mixture of the two of us, um, and then this person left. So I ended up turning mm-hmm. the torch. Uh, but I did, I did still use up. You know, I still to this day actually use a lot of their process or the, a lot of their ideas anyway. Um, all right. So year one, I think that if you can come out of the year, and this is my belief, with basic principles in place, maybe maybe like three or four, like actual policies. Mm-hmm. that support your claim a a prioritization or at least like like a team or at least a, a concept that concept, you've communicated yeah. like we will all sit down at the budget cycle together we will all talk about the fact that you can't all have a million dollar project right like one of you gets it and here's why yep mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this kind of thing mm-hmm. um I think those are key elements for year one yes absolutely you know i think one of the things that, that a lot of these organizations are missing right is you Right. They're yeah. missing you, the IT leader that's going to join them. Right. Mm-hmm. So they don't know. They make assumptions based upon previous experiences, both good and bad. Right. And they, they come to the table with their own agendas. You need to come with yours. But remember, two ears, one mouth. Listen a little bit more those first seven months, because later on, you're going to be able to use your mouth and other yeah. people will start listening. That's right. And I also think that if they're bringing you in as, as an IT leader, that they really do want to hear what you have Absolutely. to say. Absolutely. They, they, Yes. You're, you're, if you've made it through the interview process and you're, you're in there taking a, a leadership position, you're on the management team, they, they, they're going to listen. They, they want, in some respects, they may be like, we're going to do what you want to do. Like, you gotta, you're, you're here. This is your responsibility. You own this. Come back to us with the plan. And they can push back on it, but ultimately the decision is yours in a lot of these instances. I think in smaller companies, they're, they're entrusting you with that capability and that talent to come in and and make those decisions. That's why you're there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to, then with that thought in mind, let me ask you this next question. Sure. And then I want you to answer the next question with that thought in mind, yeah. okay. which is, okay, so now that you've said that, when you walk in there and they're saying, no, no, you do what you're going to do. Like you're the expert, you, you do your thing and we're all going to sort of get on board with that. How do you determine what level of governance is realistic? Mm-hmm. Like what, what are all the metrics you're going to use? What are all the points of data you're going to use to determine, okay, for this company, I'm going yep. to do this. Or for this company over here, I'm going to do that. Like, what are the things that you're going to do? And how do you keep them, like, realistic and not aspirational? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But more importantly, and maybe this is a second question that we can tackle in a minute, but yep. eventually you, you're either going to bomb as a company or you'll succeed. Mm-hmm. Sure. And is it going to be your legacy that's going to carry forward? And how do you make sure that what you do today mm-hmm. is going to be in that legacy? But but before we get to that, let's answer the first question. Yeah, yeah. Is, okay, so you're now like sort of the top banana. Um, how are you going to assess? <laughs> what, how are you going to come up with your ideas? Like, what are you going to do? I think you've got to assess the overall IT spend. You got to understand what that is. What's your portfolio of systems and tools and processes? What's the org structure in the company? Uh, who reports into who? get to understand the connections within the company, sort of the social culture. Um, like Nathan said, you know, getting out and connecting and meeting people and building bridges and connections. Yeah. Uh, th- you've got to do that. But in terms of the data, cybersecurity information, any assessment you can do around I- identity, and again, assuming IT is part of, uh, cybersecurity is part of your role, having that in place, um, assessing the IT standards and how decision-making process is happening for IT investments. Is, is important to know. Um, I'd say also just getting partnered with in a, in a life sciences organization, um, understanding any quality metrics that exist, 
and how they work, how that, what their expectations of IT are, um, whether it's for audit needs, whether it's for um, overarching risk management, understand if those policies and procedures already exist. Uh, make sure you have that library of policies that you're getting from the company. A lot of it is identify, data fact, d data, in, understand if there's any rules, <laughs> you yeah. know, anything at all. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a big effort, uphill effort, if you don't have those things, because not only do you have to help design those, you may be accountable to design them, you need others in the organization to review and and buy into them as well. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's artifacts you're going to get your arms around. The data, you know, typically uh, IT, if there's data governance or anything like that, kind of doing your own assessment, that has to happen right away. And then you can go back and say, here's here's what I think the top three priorities are. Yeah. And they very well may be, uh, great, this is why you're here, thank you, you know. Or it might be, Look, we just had a, a, a someone come in earlier. We had a previous head of IT. This is what they did. You know, th how do you want to assess that? How do you want to move forward with that? We think this is good enough. And, you know, going back and forth and having that dialogue. But uh, t to Nathan's point, that first few weeks, months, building that rapport and relationship helps you to go and present those top three things and build that sort of trust with the management leadership team. And if we could build on Mike's point here, right, but not necessarily repeat, is that, you know, you, yep. you, you, you build that, you, you, you build that wave of consensus, right, by gathering the data, right, so they hired you for a reason, right, yep. your, Mike, your point's perfect, right, like, mm -hmm. you don't have imposter syndrome, right, you, yep. you were brought in for a reason, right, she or he is there to do the leadership portion of technology management, right, yep. information technology management, get your head wrapped around security, first and foremost, get your head wrapped around your data, mm -hmm. right? And then your people, right? Yeah. Once you get those three sort of tenants in place and you said you have an understanding, now go ask questions, be inquisitive, yeah. right? Go go gut check this. You may have collected data, but it doesn't necessarily make it fact, yeah. right? Go see it, go pressure test it. And then, and then advocate, advocate strongly for security. One of the biggest pushbacks I see in our industry is the, the, the anti to spending money the, the on security. IT advocate. Correct. To whom? To the broader business. Okay. Yeah. The, um, you know, I, I, in the roles that I'm serving in, it would be an executive leadership team, right? Uh, okay. um, typically, there's not a steering committee yet. I'm typically recommending a steering committee, right? Uh, there's typically not enough people for a steering committee, mm -hmm. right? People are That's already a steering committee for steering structure. committee for for decision making, got it, got right? It. Yeah. Because you know there are those three tenants around project management, right? Yep. You have resource, time, and money, right? Mm -hmm. And you have mm -hmm. a finite amount of all of those, right? Yep. Um, you know, so, you know, recognizing that the business has an agenda to develop a product, right, that's, that's going to be delivered to market, hopefully, right? And that's where they want to focus the money and the spend, right, both on the talent to, to make that product, right? right? right. We, need to, we need to advocate for the business, right? And this is the, this is the position I have taken for years is mm -hmm. that I'm not advocating for IT. I'm advocating for us. That's right. The business. The whole company. Right? The whole that's business. That's, so That's the key. I mean, I think that... Uh, you mentioned the three, the three sort of key resources, right? Um, and the three, three key pillars of governance. I think what we talked about was the idea that uh, you have a pretty clean environment you're walking into. But let me f just sort of twist that prior question. Mm. You walk in and, hey, Mike, you know, Nathan, great to meet you. So wonderful that you're here. Oh my God, we've heard so many great stories. By the way, our ERP implementation starts tomorrow. So <laughs> I've been there. So, yeah, yeah. So, me too. So me now, too. now you have a single data point on which to build your governance. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you at that moment? And again, let's just pretend whatever context you want about that company, everything you know up to that moment. Do you at that moment try to implement governance, or do you go with that? I would go with it. And then, and then. Push, kick it down the road, governance a, a bit down I, the road. I, Unless you feel like you have the ability to stop the project. If it's not, it depends on the project, I guess. ERP, you might be able to push a little out, but it depends. You know, you're going to go public yeah, next I mean, month. I don't want to get overly semantic. Let's just say that it's, just, e, it's ERP, and they need, yeah. they need it in because it's four months before quarter close. Or I, I, that wouldn't work, actually. Well, I think it also... It's mathematically irrelevant. <laughs> uh, it's four months before year-end close. There we go. Thank you. Right. There we yep. go. Yeah. Yep. yep. All right. So, you know, we're, we're you know, uh, yeah. The, I think you're, you're, um, as, as somebody that tries to help 
nurture leaders, build leaders, right? Yeah, In yeah, some way, yeah. right? Uh, um, don't make waves those first few months, right? Yep. Human well, beings yeah. react in very specific ways and very, very yep. sort of common ways, right? I am not a psychologist. I happen to be raised by one, so that's why I have all the problems I have. Um, <laughs> but it has given Welcome me a little, the show. right? <laughs> it has given me a little bit of insight on, on you know, the the way that humans work. And I, I tell people pretty consistently. You'll yeah. see on my LinkedIn profile and other things I've done is that I try to lead with a humanistic approach, right? Because mm-hmm. um, at the end of the day, I'm here to serve the, serve the purpose and intents of humans, right? Um, I would not recommend creating a wave. Now, I would advise them that this may not be the best time to do this because you have other deficiencies that you weren't aware of because you didn't yep. have me there yep. Yep. but it would be an advisement not a full stop yep okay. right? agree. agree completely agree yeah. it's it's you don't want to like we were talking about the low hanging fruit and building credibility you don't want to just my opinion want to drop in new constructs and ideas if there's priorities in the business that they've already decided need to be done um now, you can, as that implementation happens, you can start to instill those values and principles into that project, but it's not going to be, it may not be exactly what you do for the next project. Right. But you can try to start to use that as an example to steer. Oh. Uh-huh. You're like. One of the ways I would do this is a post mortem. Oh, yeah. a lot there of, it yeah, is. Yeah. Hey, so, hey, yeah. hey, hey. I saw it was coming. Yeah, so, so yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's an area where a lot of companies, new co's, right, are they're they're unaware. So right? hold on a second, folks, yeah. before you continue. Oh, sorry, they're not. No, no, no. That was I, I want you to continue right where you left off. But I find out they're not actually called postmortems anymore. Oh. Yep. Uh, so I still call them postmortems, but they're technically called post project assessments, or or there's a, there's a several terms, right. but these PPAs. Is what I was told to call them. Post project. Yeah, because post mortems has kind of a dark tone. It's kind of a dark, sort of morbid tone, which is actually assumption that, accurate for most projects. Yeah, it's like, what if the project went well? Is it a post mortem? Well, when I, I wrote this book in 2020, I was, <laughs> I was recently told, in somewhere in the last few months, that it's actually a no longer called post mortems, Nate. They're called post project assessments. Now, that person could have made that up, but. We will call the postmortems here. Yeah, postmortems, so man. Point. That's what I remember post-mortems, too. Postmortems. <laughs> thank you. So the, the topic, great governance, right? So if we're if we're if we're coming in as leaders, which we are, right, yeah. uh, and we're we're expected to uh, apply, right, supply governance, right, mm-hmm. that's effective mm-hmm. across the business, both now and in the near term, right. Yep. One of the ways you can do it is by trickling it in, right? It doesn't have to be a deluge, right? True. Yep. So, so drop in the idea that at the end of this, you'd like to have a, a, a session where you both gather internal feedback, but also feedback from your mm-hmm. external partners on things that you could do better, things that you could have, you know, improved upon in those in that nature, and then have a real, real conversation inside, you know, professional, of course, right? That really takes an assessment of what was done how it was done and and allow it to be and this is one of the things i think i i love most about working in life sciences is that you can always go back to a room of scientists or researchers and say look it i'd like to use the scientific methodology around this and typically you get very little pushback from the yep. the leadership team because yep. they are former scientists very mostly yep. so so that's great so you walk into a company hey mike nice to meet you nathan great glad that you're here I know you're only nine days in. We're putting ERP in next week. Uh, Mike, you would just let them run with it. Let's uh, do it. So would you then use a postmortem later mm-hmm. to, to re- retroactively sort of walk them through how project management would have made the project better? Yeah, I think uh, doing some sort of re- PPA. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> po- postmortem uh, to, to, to review the project. We actually PPAs now, Mike. What are they called? They're called PPAs now. PPAs? Yeah. What did I say? Postmortem. Oh, postmortems. They're called PPAs. <laughs> oh, they're, just kidding. They're postmortems. Postmortems. Um, yeah, I would Mike, use. You got to stay with it. I would use that project that as a um, as an example, like to, to first of all, that like we were saying, implement, trickle it in. Yeah. But doing some sort of review afterwards would be yeah. would be very helpful. Using that as. And then by that and then point if you in time, it, you're going to know who your friends are, right? And friends is probably a strong word, right? You're going to understand who your advocates are and within yeah. the business. And so you're going to understand how to work and yeah. politicize the things that you need done, right? Sure. And if the project goes great, maybe you don't need it yet. But you still, 
Well, you, no, you still offer it. Yeah, you know still why? offer it. Because it's the fir- that's that first point where you're bringing everybody together as a collective, yes. and you're saying, we no, need to make this a cultural change. No, I'm saying that in that post-mortem, oh. you're basically saying, wow, that went really oh, well. Oh, I see. Okay, And so I don't need it, to huh? drop all this stuff but, in. I no, can prioritize on something else. No, no. Well, okay. So, totally agree and agree. But I will <laughs> say that I have one more thought on this, which is some post-mortems, that I think there are actually four areas that you cover. Mm. You covered what went well. Mm-hmm. And that could be a very long list. Like, oh my mm-hmm. God, we were so great back slapping and toasting. <laughs> and then what didn't go well. Mm-hmm. Yep. And no project ever Absolutely. is free of things that didn't go well. Well, well, I would have been okay if Mike hadn't fucked up. Ah! Right? But postmortems are finger free. That's yes. right. Uh, yes. So there's no. What can we do better? There's no, like, if Mike, it would have been like, actually. I wish I would have worked harder with Mike <laughs> to help Mike through his deficiencies on his project. I love that. Man, is that what that means when you hear that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I take it a step further, right? Um, uh, so two things I do want to... Oh, 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 yeah. Sorry to right, No, no, go ahead. No, you're, you're the host. Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just arrogant. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, before I forget, I, if I don't say those two things, I'm going to forget them. So there's what went well, what didn't go well. Mm-hmm. Um, what we'll do better next time, mm-hmm. what we'll improve upon next time, and then C. I'm sorry. C? Okay. Letter C? The letter C. That's the fourth thing, is the letter C. You just write it at the top of the program. Anyway, so the three things for post project mortems are what we did well, what we didn't do well, and what we'll do again better in the future. Three things for post mortem, not four. I lied. Go ahead. Well, I yeah, and apologies. No, I, the, 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 I'm uh, just fucking with you. No, yeah, yeah the the um. So I I my my I do I do a few things you know from a from a leadership standpoint, right? As it relates to like trying to impart um you know this idea of process and rigor, right? Mm-hmm. And it's to one when I'm talking with people, right? Departmentally speaking, right? When I'm speaking to a department or speaking to like how something was done. What I'll do is I'll suggest what could have been done, not from an individualistic perspective, but more from a group sense, right? It typically is poor process and planning leads to poor performance, right? And so, like, if you do proper Whoa. process is that an acronym? It, from the military, yeah. So the so the so if you do proper planning, right, you you can potentially impact proper process, right? You could also mess it up completely, sure. right? Sure. Um, planning doesn't necessarily mean that you don't foo bar the mission, right? Whoa. Uh, I like that. Yeah, right. All right. So that means fucked up beyond relief, right? You know? <laughs> That's for sure. Fubar. Fubar, baby. So, AF. Yeah, yeah. Fubar AF. So the, the, where I try to recommend is like, you know, let's use, poor Mike has been using an example. Um, <laughs> we'll use Jerry. Jerry is an example. So Jerry, instead of saying, hey, Jerry, you really, you, used to it. you really yeah. screwed up that process. What I would say is, from my perspective, from where I'm sitting as a new member of this group, I'm seeing a lack of process, documented process, which yep. could have potentially helped a number of teams and groups here to deliver the product on time and on target, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of, again, isolating, um, you know, another bit here is, you know, if you're going to be doing that sort of feedback piece, right? Mm-hmm. If you do have individual things as a leader, it's upon you to bring that person to the side, not wait, but bring them to the side right away privately and say to them hey this is what it didn't go right right you know mm-hmm. and, and i typically start the conversation saying by them hey how do you think that conversation went okay mm-hmm. here's how i saw this right um mm-hmm. and you know you sort of you know you praise in public and you correct in private right <laughs> um that's that's a you know a really important component there so you don't publicly belittle and shame I mean, you know, I thought that was oh man. A SharePoint sign of MikeSucks.com, you know, is not probably a horrible well, idea. I have to, oh, I have to update the book then. I'm sorry. Uh, I have to update the, cut that part of the chapter about the belittling and shaming. So I lo- and I want to make a note real quick. I, I looked up my policy. I actually lied. It's not four or three. It's five things you have to do in a postmortem. They are Samsonite. Uh, <laughs> missed opportunities. Incorrect assumptions. I thought Mike could do this, <laughs> but he's in the little chair. Uh, That's true. <laughs> things done right, things done wrong, and lessons learned. Lessons learned, yeah. I love so I, I'm sorry. I just spent a lot of time in the car today. So lessons learned. It's actually five things, not four, not three, but five. And it's important that if you're going to be doing that, if you're going to get the you know post 
project, uh, you know, analysis together, right? Is that what that is, PPK? I don't know. The postmortem. The postmortem. Yeah, let's just go with that. That's P easier. Postmortem yeah. analysis. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, and by the way, these don't come because we're, dark humor is a thing for us, right? So, like, you know, you, know, it's, it, um, you, you, you need to collect this feedback widely, right? Do not limit yourself to just internal teams. Oh, yeah. Collect mm -hmm. it widely from yeah. everybody, right? Distill it down, right? Give people good guardrails to work, work on, right? Yep. Um, and, and have it be open. Right. Well, ideally, I mean, the project priority, uh, that fucking word, strategic project <laughs> prioritization committee, the PPC, would help with the PPA right. to align the T's with the I's. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know where I was going. I was where you're going with that. <laughs> so, um, the project prioritization committee would be the one that would conduct the postmortem and that team would be the one that had all the members say mm -hmm. all the members of the working team in that project in a room saying okay it was mike's fault but because mike doesn't just doesn't know what he's doing exactly yeah. it's happened to a lot and it's for, so familiar for me and for future projects we probably should not have mike on that <laughs> yes that's true and then and then when they say <laughs> Mike, that was great. Could, could you go down the hall for a minute and come back? <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we'll Mike, see you in a like few you, minutes. We'd like, like you be on the next project team, but your job will be to sit over there yes. for the whole project. Okay. Go find me a... a <laughs> do you have any more docking stations? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, one more question on this topic. And I, I think we've uh, kind of beaten this a little bit to death. Well, it's actually not the last question. We'll come back to governance in future episodes. But for tonight, you just had to listen to a huge chapter and us talk about this. But I do have um, a question for these young gentlemen here. Um, looking ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Mike, put your Apple VR headset on. Mm -hmm. Looking ahead. My Neuralink. Your Neuralink. Your quantum computing iPhone. How might emerging technologies and trends, and I don't really know any big technology trends right now, but if there was one, how might those technology trends impact the future direction of IT governance? And what proactive steps can organizations or IT leaders take to harness these trends? And again, like, I don't know of any trends. I don't know if you know any trends going on right now, but like, could those trends impact governance and how might they impact governance? And if, while you think about it, I will start. Go ahead. I do not think that AI will have a big impact on the outcomes of governance, but could have a big impact on the creation of governance. And what I mean by that, I think that um, I can go into my favorite, you know, GAI engine and type in, write me a project plan. I have to have this project done in 90 days. Here's the resources I have. Here's how much time I have per week. And then it will write it for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it will probably be mostly accurate. Yep. I can probably use most of it. And then go back to my team and say, hey, look, I spent this all night writing this project plan. And uh, it, yeah, it took me all night. I haven't slept in like two days. Right. That's the creation of governance. I spent all night writing this policy. And I think it's the best for our organization. And then, of course, you did GAI to write it for you, right? The mm -hmm. creation of governance. But the outcome of governance, well, I created a policy. I created this awesome project plan. But then GAI has nothing to do with getting the people in the room, getting the vendor, doing the thing, connecting the thing, doing all the things to the outcome. Mm -hmm. So where do you think, and I'm just using one particular yeah, little sure. trend, but where do you think any of the technolog technological trends that are coming out today can impact? I don't know if it's an emerging trend, but I, I do think the abundance of cybersecurity incidents has refocused the need for risk, governance, risk, and compliance across organizations. And they're in the public eye, they're in the consumer market, you know, they're happening to family members, you know, it's all sorts of things, people being scammed. Um, and it's helped to re refocus the spending on cybersecurity, but not just uh, spending. I, I, I think, you know, get what is it, 8 to 10% of your IT budget should be cybersecurity. It probably should be more. Um, Can I ask you a question? Sure. What percentage is your budget for cybersecurity? 10. 10? Hmm. What about you? Well, reflecting on your last 
FTE role. Right. Yeah. So yeah, my current roles are mostly working for a lar large pharmaceutical companies and early startups. Um, well, let me let me use both as an example, right? Um, I know that one of the large pharmaceutical companies I'm working with right now, right? Their 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 budget for this, and I don't know how I came about it. This was pretty significant, and I asked them, you know, what is that of your overall percentage? And they said, well, it's up three percent from last year. Mm -hmm. um, so their leadership is hearing them, right? Um, I don't want to give the total number out, but it's it's higher than ten. Yeah. Um, the it this, should be. I yeah. think it should be much higher than ten. Well, the costs are there, yep. right? So it supports it. You can have that. You have the da the data to support the the need, sure, right? Sure. For the for the early stage biotechs um, and life science companies, um, you know, ten years ago it was security, not cybersecurity, right? Yep. It's matured into cybersecurity, right? Because the threats have matured. Um, it's now becoming not only okay, but expected that you come in with a cybersecurity plan and approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my last budget, I think it was, I, I used a sort of decentralized model, um, you know, where I had nobody really on my team that was a cybersecurity expert, but I hired cybersecurity companies to help support me. And then I aligned them with my various service providers yep. and put together an incident response plan that included them. Um, that was about 8% of my budget. Okay. I'm about yeah. 10%. I think that's where AI comes in is yeah. to, to when you're talking about fostering. If we're talking about a cybersecurity security lens, yeah. fostering uh, the change, the, the governance culture, is that you can use AI. There'll be a lot of bad things, but on the cybersecurity side, to to be able to use AI to train people on what real bad looks like. So that's almost both. That's almost both the input and the outcome. Yes, you're using it to create the training. Yep. And then potentially having it do the training. But also be the person, be the hacker, be, be the, the be the be the social engineer -er. hmm. um, and those those products are emerging already. They're they're pretty new. Um, but to help people see how how scary some of this stuff is, yeah. but also to be the person who is being the victim yeah. as well. Yeah. And show them how to react uh, and put them through a situation. I think that will drive the learning piece. But the governance piece around policy and procedure governance and risk is just, it's going to continue to escalate. And in order to show that, you're going to have to have some semblance of governance to be able to do that successfully. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. And I think, um, I think, wow, like in terms of governance, right, like process, process you, can, you can write all the process you want. There still requires a majority of human interaction to make a process occur, especially mm -hmm. on the governance side. We Portals. talked about sort of three big areas of governance, but I mean, just a governance at large, it's still a very human person-to-person -person mm -hmm. sort of process kind of thing. It's not really... You need constant in. engagement and buy-in, right? Yeah. So you can write all the policy. You can write a very tight policy. You can even train a very tight policy, right? But if you're not consistently engaging them, right, the companies... So one of the trends that I'm seeing is a positive in the governance and sort of cybersecurity, security in general, right, or maturity. Let's call it a, a, a maturity that we're seeing in, a, in an industry, at least anecdotally from my perspective, is that I'm now seeing conversations had with COOs, CEOs, right, where they hear what we're saying, right, around security and the needs. Before, it was a line item on a budget. Okay, can you get that down 10%? Um, not realizing they're cutting their nose despite their face, yet we said that for years, mm -hmm. right? There have been so many incidents that have led to large financial payouts from the insurance companies, right. which that's the trend, I think. You mm -hmm. see Chubb and the others, their rates have gone through the roof. Yes, right? insurance, yeah. Why? Because the payouts, right? Yes. So now they're hearing us. I think we've been saying it, but that's the trend I think is now sort of emerging is that they're, they're listening mm -hmm. now. So, you know, you need to take that power you're being given and use yep. it for good. And that's a, Nate, Nate had mentioned in a previous chapter, just tying those cybersecurity incidents to your your crucial assets, to the things that you go and you interview the business, you ask, what, what would happen if we lost X? What would happen if we lost Y? And having those discussions immediately raises, takes it away from an IT problem and makes it a business problem. And not to derail the conversation, Mike, but yeah. I, and, and, and Nate here, but I think one of the areas where I think if in my first seven months and I'm looking at that shit show, the sort of the medium and the, the good company, one of the things I'm absolutely doing other than a pen test absolutely doing is i'm homing a company-wide cybersecurity training event sure. yeah. where i tell them and explain to them yep. how this can really impact that's their business I think that's, a, that's, that's a must yep. do have to yep. must do and you have absolutely. it every year so that and i typically hold it in q3 why do i hold it in q3 so when i'm sitting in front of you in q4 saying i need this number <laughs> it's 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 front of mind yep right great timing too yeah do it right uh, before budget season yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i mean we're it's such a big chapter, and there's so much about governance 
that needs to be unpacked. And we're really only scratching the surface. I mean, I skipped over a bunch of stuff, but when you when you go back to your organizations, and actually I'll post all the questions that we're I had sort of put down for tonight in the in the podcast notes, but when you go back to your organizations and you go back to your your IT function, you think about governance sort of writ large. Uh, think about all the ways, not only today, but in the future and as far ahead as you can see, where using a governance, change management of governance, how you're going to sort of get the business to buy into governance is all going to be impacted by what's sort of happening and coming. Um, I mean, just, I mean, I started at Exilio in September of 22. Um, and I came in with a, a relatively sort of um, current project methodology and governance methodology that I've used. You know, this is my security stack, my compliance stack, everything. But it's only a year and a half later, and it's mostly outdated. Well, I, I would change a lot of it if I could right now, but most certainly will um, as, the, as the months and years come forward. Like, as I have opportunities to change my model, I will because... I see inconsistencies now. I see ways that I could skip over sort of hurdles because you have to not only build governance, but you have to go back and investigate it. Right. Mm -hmm. and you have to rip it apart, to tear it down, you have to yep. investigate sort of why you thought the way you did when you made this, and then find ways to improve it. One um, of the questions I really like, Nate, yeah. if, you, if I can get a second, no, is sure. the is question number seven um, that you proposed to us, right? which is what tools or techniques could help analyze past data growth to inform governance needs typically in the data management governance areas, right? Yeah. Um, that's an area where I think there's sort of a gap in, in a lot of our technologists leaders, right? It's a, it's, these are products that a lot of them don't have mm -hmm. the budget or exposure to. Um, and it's an area where that can help you in that first seven months, eight months, really help identify things you weren't aware of because there's nothing worse than the unknown unknowns, right? You know, so it's just one of those questions that really, like, I was like, ooh, that's a good I, one. I like that one. It's a, it's a big one, too, because we all have our favorites. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to call anybody out? Well, I'd come up with, you know, a list of a few here, right, that I thought might, you know, sort of fall I'll into. I'll get my air horn ready. Uh, mm. So there's... Uh, in my my eyes old old man over here uh attica one uh is is one calibria data governance and then i love that one i've used them before that is yeah. that is when i made it number two only because i figured if i yeah. said it number one it'd be like fanboy yeah um, i'm a fanboy and, <laughs> and then and then ibm has a really good data governance uh service as well okay, uh which I'll is one yeah. <laughs> Probably not the right audience for IBM, right? But but there but though that's an area where I watches. The, oh, there you go. There you go. Well, the, the uh, this is a uh, this is an area where I think it's again it's you know if you don't have exposure, you're not sure how to lead. You know, yep. you're not a lead, and it's it's hard to make good decisions with a, no, without it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm busting your balls. No, it's, no. Uh, yeah. I, no, IBM. I mean, we there's a there's an an enamorment that we have, the sort of this idea that good project management tools, good project, they can only be current. Like there's only the newest new can be the things that brings us to the promised land. You know, the notions and the asanas, et cetera, and the smart right. teacher. But in fact, why wouldn't we look to what we already know, like has been tried and true. And some of us, and I, I'm guilty of this, are like, oh, tried and true, but new and shiny and touchy things over here. Yeah. Get that shit over there. <laughs> Did you see the logo? I, it's a cute yeah. logo. Oh my god. And they have they have coffee mugs <laughs> and socks at the convention. I think you bring it up Calibra brings a whole other we won't go down the rabbit hole, but one thing that <sighs> at some point we should definitely talk about is the idea of data governance yes. and the implementation of data governance. It's I think it's a very challenging thing. Um, we are talking about that. An episode we are oh great because let's talk about it then but i i think that is that is one that now more than ever in, whether it's cybersecurity or it's it governance or it's automation or it's ai you got to have data governance before you can do any of those things this feels like one of those pivot things yeah. that you know it sort of becomes a central focal Brings point you to 2 exactly yeah, yeah. Yep, yep absolutely and if you don't have it it's going to be really hard to get there yes. Se season 2 episode 9 <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, we got a long way to go before we get. It'll be called something else by then. 
bookmark this. <laughs> They're going to wheel Nate and Mike into the barn and be like, here you go. And Mike will be in his little chair. Data governance. Data governance. Oh. <laughs> Crap. I got to piss again. Uh, oh, we, we don't have to wait all the way. We can talk about data governance. Because you know what? You know who loves data governance more than anybody? This guy. Yes. I fucking love data governance. I love talking about data governance. I love data architectures. Unstructured data, structured data, metadata, all the data, AF. I, I feel like that is a... Um, we should have a podcast in just on data. I feel like there's there's so many uh, large consultancies that do data governance as part of their, their portfolio, their service right. catalog. There needs to be a company where that's all they do. Dude, just, we talked about this. Just, just data governance, because it's that important. Like... Do one thing really well. What was that? Have a repeatable Episode model that six you or seven. We talked about Ray Wang's report on yeah, uh, the democratization of data. Democratization Market, of data. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the data company that's coming. It's just I cannot wait. Just get get that right because that's okay. a huge influence. You need to influence. You need to be able to build a cross functional team. You need to be able to agree on every data type. I mean, and a data dictionary and just data catalog. I'm, I'm, working with, I'm working with a company right now where I can see the infighting. Yeah, right? with them it's trying to implement debate. all this out. It's a huge debate. Yeah. We may so bio IT world April 16th and 17th. We're gonna do this we data, then and then we'll do it again in season two episode nine, which will be about October. But it's we're, challenging. We're gonna get to it because it's awesome. That's multiple episodes. It's like a podcast. Season. Problems, Just do data it. Problems are good to have. Yes. Problems are good to They're have. They're fun to discuss, too. All right. So, listen, that was awesome. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, I literally we could talk about, I, I could talk about governance for a while, actually. And there's a lot of questions we didn't answer. And I apologize. Um, there's a couple other things that happened in the news recently, though. And I just kind of want to jump to those real quick. Sure. Can. Yeah. Um, I'm just making a note here before I forget. So, uh, there's a group called Algorithm Watch and another group called AI Forensics. Okay, and these two groups are the first to request um, data under this uh, newly formed EU Digital Services Act, or the DSA. Mm. Now, we're in North America. How does this impact us? Well, you know, we're seeing a lot of states put in uh, Consumer Privacy Act statutes. There's six already in place that are active. There's multiple more sort of sitting in the wings waiting to come out. Um, CCPA sort of being the, the bulwark for the uh, United States. But <clears throat> this new DSA, DSA is, a, is, is like taking GDPR to another level. So if you're mm -hmm. familiar with GDPR, um, you understand the idea of sort of personal privacy rights in, in terms of non-American uh, data. Well, the DSA is designed to give citizens new powers to their rights online. Um, there's a, actually a creation of a new thing called the Digital Services Coordinator in every EU member state. So every single EU member state has to have a DSC in place. Now, how is this important? Well, here's what Algorithm Watch found. A Dutch teenager that Algorithm Watch talked to built an Instagram presence that brought her over 20,000 followers over two years. Hmm. Then, overnight, it was gone. She had become victim to malicious reporting of her account for the sixth time in a row. Many content creators, especially women, are readily reported to Meta either by criminals who want to take over accounts or by online trolls. In theory, with the DSA, they now have a powerful tool to protect their rights, but it may fall short. Now, what I want you to do is, as a, as a viewer of the show, I want you to go read about the DSA. And I want you to read about the DSC and the rights that they've been given, especially as it relates to Meta. Uh, there's some disturbing news out there. And again, the reason I bring this up is because this DSC, and again, I said every EU member, as of, what's it say, the 21st? Yeah. As of four days ago, every EU member state had to have a, an appointed digital services coordinator. And this 
individual has a wide range of powers. This, this essentially can not only complain about users, any user in their country, but also hear complaints about users. These are called out-of-court settlement bodies, which means they require no court jurisdiction to settle disputes made. For instance, if Nathan does not like what I am posting on X, he can make a claim and have me taken down. Okay. Uh, it's supposed to be a straightforward independent body, but as it turns out, it's becoming quite corrupt. So read, read about the DSA and the DSC. I'm actually not going to read this whole article just in terms of time, hmm. but inform yourself about this new DSA and DSC uh, process for all EU member states. And so I did have one other uh, <laughs> interesting article I found. Um, I did, By the way, I did... I did find out that the .af domain, AI.af, is not available. Um, apparently, the French have not been paying their .af payments, uh, which is the broker for .af uh, hmm. outside of Afghanistan. So uh, even if I wanted to register AI.af, I couldn't anyway. But It's a bummer. Yeah, it's apparently worth a lot of money anyway because it's a two-digit domain. Okay, so the other article I found that I thought was interesting was that OpenAI, Meta, and other tech giants, and this is from Reuters, Open, open AI, Meta, and other tech giants sign effort. So they, like, sign a document, which is, you know, we all know, like, works wonders, to fight <laughs> AI election interference. So, you know, fox in the fox house or hen in the hen house or whatever. A group of 20 tech companies announced on Friday, this is uh, last Friday, that they have agreed to work together to percent de decept prevent deceptive artificial intelligence content from interfering with elections across the globe this year. So you, you see how this is going to go, right? They signed a They're going to try. They signed a document. <laughs> so it's, a it's, a it's a pledge. It's a pledge. <laughs> it's a pledge. I, I pledge to raise $5 for so, Mike's 5K. It's like the Amber, the Amber Heard argument, right? You, didn't, you pledged. You didn't donate. You pledged. Mm -hmm. Pledged. The rapid growth of generative <laughs> that artificial intelligence... <laughs> This is, a, again, Reuters. So Reuters has to dumb it down, by the way. If you've never read Reuters articles, they sort of bring it down to the, the, the lowest common denominator. The rapid growth of generative artificial intelligence, also known as GAI. Who would have known? Which can create text, images, and video in seconds, mind you. Did you know that, Mike? I in heard about this. In response to prompts... I heard about this somewhere. ...has heightened fears... Okay that the new technology could be used to sway major elections this year as more than half of the world's population is set to head to the polls. That's a big, actually, number. Um, that's not them. That's me that said that. Signatories of the Tech Accord, Tech Accord, which actually is, it should be Tech, I don't know, it's not, which was, <laughs> <laughs> tech Accord. What the fuck is a Tech Accord? It sounds good. That's a t-shirt right there. <laughs> yep. Tech Accord. Is that what you said? Tech Accord? Yes. So, signat signatories <laughs> of the Tech Accord. What the fuck is a Tech Accord? That's a shirt. Yeah, that, that's a t-shirt. Tech Accord. Signatories of the Tech Accord. Sounds like a Star Wars thing or yeah. some, like some sort of... Oh, no! It's the Tech Accord. <laughs> it's a four-legged Tech Accord. T E K A K O R D Tech Accord. Oh, uh, that's that's more like Minecraft. It's a Minecraft Tech Accord. <laughs> so signatories of the Tech Accord, which was announced at the Munich Security Conference, was in Germany. You know, yeah, sounds got to be serious. Munich's in Germany, right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just testing your geography. Skills. Let me Google that. Hold on. <laughs> so, include companies that are building generative AI models used to create content, including OpenAI, Microsoft, and Adobe. Adobe. Anyway, other signatories of the Tech Accord include social media platforms that will face the challenges of keeping harmful content off their sites, including... Meta, TikTok, and X. Yeah. Oh, X is here. All right. So, so far, that's six companies. I, 
think six. I can. Does that count six? Yeah. So we have. We have. Is Google on AI, there? Is the Alphabet's not there? OpenAI yeah, and Microsoft say, Adobe. Alphabet, yeah. Meta, TikTok, and X. Okay, so we're getting there. Hold on, there's a whole bunch of ads I have to. See. Okay, there Where's we go. Where's your Brave browser, Nate? Come I on. Know, I'm using Chrome. X. AF. The agreement includes <laughs> commitments to collaborate on developing tools for detecting misleading AI generated images, video, and audio, creating public awareness campaigns to educate voters on deceptive content, and taking action on such content on their services. So this is all going to work because, you know, technology to identify AI generated content or certify its origin could include, and this is underlined because it links to more clickbait, watermarking or embedding metadata, the company said, or they signed in their tech accord. The accord, the accord, the tech accord, <laughs> did not specify a timeline <laughs> for meeting the commitments, or in any way how each company would implement them. So they just signed the tech accord. I feel like we've heard this before. I think, yeah. no, you've never, no, one, they've, no one's ever done this before. No one's <laughs> ever signed the tech accord before. I think the utility of this accord is the breadth of the company signing up to it, said Nick Clegg, president of global affairs at Meta Platforms. We should get Nick Clegg on the podcast and find out what he does for his job. Google is on there. It's all yeah. good. And snap. I don't think Reuters likes Google though. It's all good and well if individual platforms develop new policies of detection, provenance, labeling, watermarking, and so on. But unless there is a wider commitment to do so in a shared, interoperable way, we're going to be stuck with a hodgepodge of different commitments, Clegg said after using his generator AI to generate that statement. <laughs> <laughs> Generative AI is already being used to influence politics and even convince people not to vote. And this is where the FUD part of Reuters article comes in. I love their FUD parts because they usually take a couple paragraphs and just FUD the fuck out of them. In January, a robocall using fake audio of U.S. President Joe Biden circulated to New Hampshire voters, urging them to stay home during the state's presidential election presidential primary election oh my god i'm not even gonna bother to edit that out that's gold right there <laughs> despite the popularity of text generation tools like open ai's chat gpt their yeah. third mention in the article so far uh, or the ad or the article sorry <laughs> the tech companies will focus on preventing harmful effects of ai photos and how do you pre so how do you prevent the harmful effect of an ai photo mike nathan Watermark it. Watermark it? Yeah, maybe. So you put your watermark on it, it prevents the harmful effect. So if I see oh, something that can't terrible be real. happen, I'm like, oh, it's a watermark on it. I'm cool. My brain will just clear that out of my head. That's right. No. Uh, partly because people tend to have more skepticism with text, said Dana Rao, Adobe's chief trust officer, in an interview. So again, I'll, I'll just kind of rephrase that. The tech companies will prevent, will focus on preventing harmful effects of AI photos, videos, and audio, partly because people tend to have more skepticism with text. So, basically, text dumb, pictures good. And therefore, if I see a picture, I'm going to vote for somebody versus something that they write. It says... Dana Rao, Adobe's chief trust officer, in an interview. Hmm. And then it, it finishes up by saying, there's an emotional connection to audio, video, and images. He said, your brain is wired to believe that kind of media. So, zero substantiation. There's no references to the study. There's no references to data to support these claims. You know, it's a Reuters article, so they don't do that. But essentially, the final statement is that your brain is wired to believe that kind of media. So there we go. Great. Did you know that every time you see a picture, you immediately connect it with reality? But when you read text, you're like, fuck that. That's not true. <laughs> Did you know that? 
I didn't know that. Yeah, that's that's sort of ridiculous. That's right? why I wrote my book in text because I wanted people to be like, mm, I don't know. It was written down in a book. It was written down in a book. It can't be true. If only he had put it in a picture, a single picture of like a dog taking a dump in the lawn. I would have believed his book. And how many people like these books or text, even if they have sources in them, who's going to click on them? That's the ne the next AI, you know, the, the 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 misinformation AI is they'll put sources in where you can click on them and it'll go nowhere, you know. Um, well, by the way, I, there is one more. It's just so I much noise too. So people, I think, you know, at some point people even already people don't know what to believe. So add more noise to the to the world, and it, even if it's fake from the AI and. I'm not, I'm they're, sure. they're looking for they're looking for to sell ads, right? Yeah. Every one of these yeah. companies, right? And so, it, so they're baby. they're going to do whatever they can to put a snippet of in of the news media that says, "Hey, look it, we've done something to affect yeah. change." When not affecting any change through any real yeah, they policy, can't, they can't control yeah. it. Yes, yeah. yeah. ChatGPT, words, 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 words. ChatGPT, words, 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 words. ChatGPT, some more words. ChatGPT. Right. Yep. And I'll and get a like, click. I'm like, getting a click. ChatGPT. All right. I'm though the AI Election Accord website has all of the seven principles. Read them to me. All right. Prevention. Ooh. Provenance. Detection. So hold on. Hold on. Provenance. Attaching provenance signals to identify the origin of content where appropriate and technically feasible. What does that, so mean? What, what does that mean? It's trying to hunt down the source of the origin of content. Who is? This, this accord, the services. The, the tech accord? Yeah, the tech accord, the tech accord, probably the the company that's trying to put this, uh, trying to adhere to this these rules. Um, right. by TechAccord .com. And then uh, detection, attempting to detect deceptive AI election content or authenticated content, including with methods such as reading provenance signals across platforms. That's uh, interesting. Uh, let's see, evaluation, undertaking collective efforts to evaluate and learn from the experiences and outcomes of dealing with deceptive AI election content. That does sound like it was produced by AI. The, all of these boxes. What do you think? Oh, TechCore.com is not available. Oh. What the hell? What the hell is on this site? Oh, and resilience. A new website is in the works. Supporting efforts to develop and make available defensive tools and resources such as AI literacy and other public programs. Wait, wait, say that one more time? So resilience is the box, the foundational box in the bottom of the diagram. It says resilience, supporting efforts to develop and make available defensive tools and resources such as AI literacy and other public programs, AI solutions, including open source tools where appropriate, or contextual features to help protect public debate defend the integrity of the democratic process and build whole of society resilience against the use of deception, so deceptive AI election You know content. how that was written by a generative AI bot because it's... Commas. <laughs> makes no fucking sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bunch of words. Oh, this is great. I wonder if the site was created by AI. Oh, Let's see, look at the source. Uh, but if they had followed their own tech accord, they would have watermarked the site. With so... Is this is this uh, is this deceptive use of AI for election? That there's an AI so election accord. It's very meta. Yeah, right? It's very meta, right? It's very meta. But, yeah. Like maybe this is bad for elections. Just by, by the way, just by looking at that, you've now entered my IP address for my house into the registry for people that want to be deceived in the election. Okay, perfect. We'll see how you hold up. See, you've opted in. <laughs> so, what's going to happen is I'm going to be watching TV. And random pictures are going to be flashed like every 25th frame. I'm like, why, am, why do I all of a sudden want to vote for Ooh, that candidate? There's a webcast. There's a webcast. Look at this. I wonder what this is. Look at them all sitting around the table. I can't even turn it up. Yeah, they're all there. They're all pledging. But, they're, but they, they're, they're, all, they're all there to sign something? Hey, can you give me that link so I can put it in the podcast? Yes. We want you to see the live Tech Accord signing. Yep. Which is being held in this, like, ostentatious room with a chandelier. Like it, oh, my the, God. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that room's, like, on the fourth floor at the MGM Grand. 
<laughs> right, right as you went across in the Kino slots. <laughs> I've been to that room before. I think I threw up in there. Oh, that's great. So what does that put our Wally status level at, Mike? Are we still at five? Five. All right, we're still at five. Yep. There's hope because 20 companies have signed the Tech Accord. And uh, apparently there's a techaccord.com website which is being developed. But more on that. We'll find out what's going on there. Signed by pretty much every big But hold company. on. Let's look at some of these companies. Adobe, Amazon, Anthropic, Arm. Well, so, but Eleven Microsoft Labs open, owns OpenAI. Microsoft owns LinkedIn. Yep. Who else on this list does Microsoft own? Um, th well, well, I don't think Amazon wanna... owns AWS, which owns Anthropic. Yep. Eleven uh, Labs is the vocal, the voice, um, the voice yep. AI. Yeah. And Meta. Meta's in there. Trend McAfee, Micro. Didn't he go insane? Yeah, that's a great documentary. Have you seen that oh, one? I love that oh, it's freaking love great. It. It's so, crazy. Yeah. Look, at, look at this list of companies. Like half of them are irrelevant, and the other half yeah. are owned by somebody else on the list. So. No, this is going to go really well. I suspect this election process is going to be like so clean, and no one's going to cite interference. I promise you. No yep. one will put a flag up like the guy down the street that says it was stolen by a certain so and so. You heard it here first. Yeah, you heard it here first. <laughs> this year, clean elections. Thank you, Meta. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you, Adobe, with your 642 <laughs> products that all do the same thing. All right. Awesome. So we're at level five for Wally status. That's fantastic. I love it. Um, I don't have to go down to the bunker yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this was the longest podcast that we have done to date by a lot of minutes, like <laughs> like fifty minutes or something. Unreal. So cheers! Hey, cheers to us! Yeah, cheers! cheers. Thanks for coming out. Nick. Yeah, thank you, thank you, everyone. Yeah, oh, cheers! You, you just cheers me with water. Oh, hold on. <laughs> no, it's oh watered down whiskey. <laughs> cheers me with water. Uh, mm. Mm. Oh god! Relaxing times. Uh, so thanks to Nathan for coming on. Thank you, Nathan. Well, thanks so much. We'd love to have you yeah, back. Sure. Hopefully, um, people still talk to you after this. Yeah, we'll see. Next week. <laughs> We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, only, only pretty much only my mom watches the show anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, next week, employee life cycle and employee experience. We're going to tear this mother down. Uh, it's going to be a good one. In fact, I think it might even be better than this one. I'm thinking it's going to be the bee's knees, the cat's pajamas. Seven out of seven bananas. Seven out of seven bananas. <laughs> Six stars. <laughs> um, and I can tell you what, Mike, like the reason I'm so excited about this, and I didn't tell you this before, but I, I did kind of mention the digital concierge idea. Yeah. But I want to dive into that. Let's do it. Can you imagine? Well, I don't know if you've ever used a concierge for their special abilities at a hotel before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like getting methamphetamines or something. Yeah, like, all the time. Or like, you know, You're whatever. definitely staying at better hotels than us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have. I have. I, I'm I, 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 I was talking to a friend of mine. Like I had never done that. But concierges are the people that know everything about everything. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, what's going down? Where to go? Like, did you ever see the Lincoln Lawyer? Oh yeah. No, I haven't seen it. You haven't seen the Lincoln Lawyer? No, I haven't. It's really good. Um, I watch. I should I'm watch that. Think of a, what's a, what's another show that has like a kick-ass supporting role? The Cleaner. With uh no no not the cleaner the uh, what's the one with um, George Clooney where he's the lawyer cleaner guy oh yeah Michael C Michael Clayton Michael Clayton the, yeah or, great or movie. Winston Wolf yeah these are the guy, people that like uh, they're on the inside track you're like hey I got Nathan I got a problem I need you to fix and Nathan's like no problem I go fix it and it comes back and it's the fixer fixed. the fixer but the fixer. Concierge, <laughs> but the digital concierge right. version of the fixer <laughs> like hey I need a I need a laptop. And you're like, there you go. Or meet me at the back of my trunk in three hours. I'll take care of you. That's kind of like a digital concierge. That's what I'm talking about. So next week we're talking about digital concierge. Let's do it. I, I like that. More, I got some more ideas. I'm just sort of, I'm still flushing it out right now. They're coming out. They're coming out right now. Um, sort of riffing on it. So <laughs> as I said, very, very, like a really long time ago in this episode, hours ago, 
if I could give you all the stars, I would give you all the stars. And I know that sounds actually like a like a early 2000s movie between star-crossed lovers or something, but if I could give you all the stars, Mike, I'd give you all the stars. I mean, Nathan, you get all the stars. My listeners and viewers, you get all the stars. So if you could please just give us back like some of those stars, like five of them <laughs> on, on all the podcasts and things, that'd be awesome. Because we can't, well, we can't get better until we get more stars. I mean, we're just going to keep being like a flat line. <laughs> stars makes us go like this. Uh, like up. Two? Two stars up. No, to the stars. Oh, to the stars. <laughs> Fuck, Mike. I teed that one like a, like a slow pitch. Two, two stars ball. up, man. Two stars up. So in our show links, we have in our show we have <laughs> links. We have links to buy us a beer, which actually goes directly to buying uh, us beer <laughs> and, and other equipment. <laughs> And buy Mike a taller chair. Yes. My ass is on f- We have... <laughs> so sore right now. We have a link. <laughs> I'm we have a link up. to our merchandise store, which oh. is the, the coit.myspreadshop.com. <laughs> Spread... <laughs> now I know why they didn't want that domain name. I misspelled it. Um, we have a initially. new... We have, an, we have an Insta post coming out. Uh, tomorrow, and I know I have to say that because it's I kind of feel kind of dumb. Like they should be coming out like I guess every five minutes if yeah. I was really doing this right. But my daughter's handling it. She's an Instagram savant. She's got the whole thing covered. All kinds of funny stuff coming out. Um, don't be a dick, especially to people in IT. They work very hard. Um, they do make pretty decent money but they're generally underappreciated and all the problems of the world fall on them they can work great 364 days a year screw up one time and then their whole year is over so don't be a dick be nice to IT um, be cool to IT actually and it will get paid back in spades IT people love cool people call friends of IT be cool to IT we'll come back to you uh, bark less wag more got your pet spayed or neutered Nathan above Maybe. all else we're human beings remember that we're human beings, and we only have Thank a very you. limited time on this yeah. earth. So make a positive impact, not a negative impact. Mike? Thank you, Nathan, for coming in. Yeah. It's great to meet you for the first time. Yeah, yeah. As well. Nice to meet you great as well. Great to meet you. Yeah. And uh, everyone hang in there. It's going to be an excellent week next week. And we're... Why? Uh, Why? Because it's just going to be a great week. Oh, I, feel oh I, can, so I love that. I feel like it's going to be warmer. The days seem to be getting longer. I yeah. drove over here and the sun was still up. It was great. Uh, so excited to be here again next week, and we're going to talk about employee experience, and we're going to do some fun stuff. I am looking forward to crashing the bio IT world and yeah, ending I up on a, on the street on the, the fold up table. You know. I think it would be more fun if we were like get kicked out. That's what I mean. Set up shop. I I, I I sort of envisioning it's like who the hell are you guys? Get out of here. And we're like <laughs> we're calculus of IT. Like we're <laughs> this is what this is our thing. This is what we do. And they're like. Well, where's your media pass? And I just pull out like a, a laminated card I made in my my house, <laughs> like right here. It says media on it. Media on one side, pass on the other. <laughs> so you flip it. <laughs> it says like PAX East 2014 on the back. Yeah. Like it's right here, media. Right here, I got it. Get out whatever old conference badges. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, Take them all out of your shirt. Same. Like yeah. put like fifty of them on. Like it's gotta be in here somewhere. That's what we should do. See if we can find any of our old ca- just wear all of them. All I have them. I have last year's bio IT world patch. Just wear it in. Like I thought, <laughs> oh, notice. I thought, I thought They're not life. gonna notice. This <laughs> is for life. <laughs> okay, we're in so much trouble. Thank you everyone. You guys yeah. are the best. Thanks for watching. You no, you are the best. No, you're the best. You're the best. You're the best, you're the best, you're the best. Peace. Peace. That's for the out, as L.E.G. would say. <laughs> hey, where, where, when did we get the trance music? I thought you were working I'm working on, working some, on some, some stuff. Outro tunes. It's not ready yet. <laughs> I just uh, put together a huge... Well, if I play anything, it's going to get canceled by it is. somebody. It is. I, that's why I, I have the drum, the drum machine up here, so we could just like, do an outro like trance riff. It's a whole separate podcast. I think we just do a big online trance, like six hours. Just blast it all through. Just start off. We really suck at the beginning. Then, as like the hours go on, we all the beats are better. off. It's like <laughs> it's all screwed up. 
like 12 hours later, by the very end, we managed to compose one beat. <laughs> we just put it on a loop. Such a fat loop. <laughs> Oh, listen oh to this God. synth sample we made. It took four hours. Okay, I'm okay. I just swallowed the fly. Oh, All my right. goodness. Oh. That was awesome. That was good. That was... Yeah. Um, that was fucking really long. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs>